Steve Kermea. The Zoning Board of Appeals will hold a public hearing in the Selectman's Meeting Room at the Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, on Thursday, July 10th, 2014, at 7 p.m. on the petition of Thomas Wise, who seeks a variance and a special permit under sections 4.3.2.8.2.B slash 4.3.2.8 of the zoning bylaws in order to add an addition to the existing single family dwelling and to create an accessory apartment as per a plan submitted on the property located at 181 South Street in Reading, Massachusetts. Uh, unless there's an objection, I will dispense with the reading of the abutters list, except to say that the abutters were notified, as were the following. Board of Selectmen, Town Clerk, Police Department, Fire Department, Building Department, Conservation Commission, Health Department, Assessor's Office, Engineering Division, CPDC, members and associate members of the Board of Appeals, as well as the planning boards of Wakefield, Linfield, North Reading, Stoneham, Woburn, and Wilmington. Now, uh, testimony given before this board is taken under oath. So if you think you may want to speak tonight, either for or against the project as an abutter or even as the proponent, the project proponent, please stand and raise your right hand. We'll swear you in. Uh, I swear that the testimony given by me before this board will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Proper responses, I do. Is the uh, petitioner here or is represented? Evening, uh, Mr. No. Chairman, members of the DBA. My name is Michael Conway. I'm here on behalf of the city. Okay. The floor is yours. Are you at the table? Yes, you may. Thank you. So we are here for uh, a continuation of a, a previous meeting, and I've been working with the team here, the petitioners, the architects, the builders. Uh, I've gone through all the materials. I've taken a look at the proposed minutes from last meeting. Uh, I promised Tom I wouldn't speak all night, but I would like to address the specific concerns and issues that came up at the last meeting. I think it's a good place to start for us to sort of get on the same page and see where we are. Um, as well, since the last meeting, there have been some changes, which I think will affect uh, some of the information that was given to the board uh, last meeting, as well as the possible outcome. So as stated in the notice, we are seeking a variance of a special permit for an accessory apartment under section 4.3.2.8.2B. Um, and going back to the last meeting, there were numerous <coughs> concerns that I found in the minutes, some that I couldn't uh, tell what the actual issue is. I'm sure we'll flesh those out, but I found six distinct issues that came up that I'd like to address. Uh, the first issue was the side yard setback, and I think it was uh, the chair who uh, took a look at the plot plan last time and determined that the rear setback may not be acceptable, and I, I think the number was 14.6 that he would come up with, mostly because it wasn't noted on the plot plan. Since last meeting, we have had a revised plot plan done. All of the setbacks are noted. Because of some changes to the architecture, both side, uh, side setbacks are now 17.75 feet. So you can see at Appendix A, which is the new plot plan. So at this point, all the setbacks meet the criteria necessary. Uh, that was the only one in question, and it's obvious it's uh, well over. The next issue that came up was the entrance to the unit on the plans that were submitted last time. And I think the concern, at least as far as I can see, was that the entrance looked like, quote unquote, another house. In other words, there was a front door already, now there was another entrance and a porch. Um, since the last meeting, the architectural plans have been redone. You'll see if you look at uh, Appendix B, which is the new set of plans. I think the best uh, pages to look at are A10 and A11. The entrance has been moved to the side, so it's completely non-visible from the front as you're driving by. You'll also see that there was a porch at one point that has also been removed. So if you look at, I think A10 is the best. As you can see, the new accessory clearly just looks like another portion of the home. And then the side elevation, you can see where the new, new door would be. 
So I think that's taking care of that issue. You know, from what I've seen in the submissions and from driving up and down in the neighborhood, and this house looks almost exactly like many of the other colonials in that area with the new renditions. Uh, it's not significantly larger than any of them. In fact, there are a lot of homes in the area that are larger than this one. I know the plans, it looks sort of larger than life, but if you've driven by, which I think most of you folks do, you can see that it really, based on these plans, would fit in um, very closely with all of the other homes in the area. The next discrete issue that came up, there was some concern that the board couldn't grant a variance and a special permit in the same meeting. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to say that I don't think with this case we need a variance, and we'll get to that later. But in the event that we do, there are two cases that, uh, prior cases with this board that we've cited, Appendix D and Appendix F, where they were accessory apartments, uh, they applied for a variance and a special permit, and both were granted in the same meeting. So I think that sets precedent that this board would in fact be able to grant, if necessary, a, um, a variance and a special permit in the same meeting. Going on through the minutes, I saw there was some concern about spot zoning. I know this comes up uh, when you have situations where it's either rare that it comes before the board or uh, a situation where it's difficult to interpret the zoning. But I would submit that in this case, there is no spot zoning. We are not before you asking you to change the zoning whatsoever. In fact, it's just the opposite. We're looking for you to give us exactly what the bylaw offers construction of an accessory apartment. In fact, if you look at the uh, section 4.3.2.8.1, which is the purpose of this bylaw, it says to encourage the construction of a limited number of housing units. The bylaw is encouraging this and using the word construction. That's all that we're asking for. In fact, the two cases we cite at Appendix D and Appendix F were looking for essentially the same thing that was granted by this board, and in both cases, there was, they were not deemed to be spot zoning. So I don't see that as a distinct issue here um, in, in my look at both this case and the two prior cases that we've cited. Now one of the, the uh, more major issues as I see them was the square footage requirement under the zoning bylaw. And that's the gross and net square footage. And what's most significant at this meeting is that there were changes to the plans which reduced the gross and net square footage of the proposed accessory. We've also now been able to uncover the square footage of this property as it was in 1982 in an attempt to make that clearer based on the bylaw. So what we did is we got the assessor's card from October 12th of 1982. We also confirmed that there's been no construction from August 1st of 1982 to October uh, 12th of 1982 as best we could. And based on that, and this is in page four of our submission, you'll see that our sort of starting or jumping off point is 2,172 square feet. And that's based on the information that we provided. We excluded the areas that are to be excluded, and we went off of the town's measurements. Um, so if you look at that calculation, that would allow us, by the bylaw, the one-third calculation would be 724 square feet. Um, if you look, again, I, I, sorry I'm jumping around, but all this stuff is in different places in the submission. If you look at a, Appendix B, A6, page A6, it shows you that the proposed gross square footage of the accessory is 721, and the net square footage is 664. So again, we are now within the guidelines as set forth in the bylaw. So I think that, that issue goes away, and any variance related to that issue uh, goes away, as I know it came up last time. Um, and again, these changes were made by um, essentially shrinking by, I think, about a foot and a half the structure, so we could get it within the guidelines. The next issue, and, and I'm sure this was a, a sig significant portion of the time, is the, the interpretation, if you will, of section 4.3.2.8.2b. Uh, and that's where we get to this argument, this sort of back and forth, uh, where it, it talks about one third of the gross floor area of the dwelling, which is part of, which I think the board has at times said in the last meeting, uh, you know, that is within sort of the footprint of the 1982 timeframe where 
we stopped it on August 1st of 1982. I don't agree with that. I, I don't think that this section is meant to be a within value. I don't think that uh, based on several things that an accessory has to be within the footprint of the 1982 dwelling. And there are really three reasons I say that. The first is the, the purpose of the bylaw, which we've looked at and we've read already. They're trying to encourage alteration and construction of accessory apartments. And to me, those are two separate things, two distinct things, and they use both words in the bylaw. They use alteration, they use construction. Construction to me is building something new. So if you're building within the footprint of an old house, you're not building something new. I think the bylaw was meant to allow alteration of existing homes, as well as building new structures that meet the guidelines of the bylaw. The second, and I think most important with regard to the interpretation, is the precedent of this board. Now, I've attached two uh, very recent cases, one from 2012, one from 2013. The first was 12-08, uh, which was 43 Belmont Street. And you'll find the board's decision at Appendix D. Essentially, what happened, there was the structure that was built in 1982. There was an addition that was built in 1984. They were petitioning this board to allow the accessory apartment in the area that was built in 1984. Clearly not within the 1982 footprint. That was in all of the submission papers, and the board was well aware of it. Uh, the board specifically looked at Section A and then made a note in their decision that they looked at all the other sections of the bylaw for accessory apartments. And at that time, they determined that a variance and special permit would be allowed for this petitioner to build an accessory apartment outside of the original 1982 footprint of the building. So basically, that de decision shows that they looked at the bylaw as it being part of the structure and not <coughs> within the structure. And that's crystal clear based on the fact that this area that was built in 1984 was in fact part of the assessment. The second case that I submitted at Appendix F is case 13.22, and this was 63 Whittier. And what the petitioner had asked here is that they be allowed to completely demolish the home, build a new home with an accessory apartment, and I believe it was a non-conforming lot. Uh, they built bigger than the original footprint, and the accessory apartment was way outside of the original footprint. Again. Uh, the board looked at the bylaw and allowed a variance and a special permit, again saying that the accessory need not be within the footprint of the 1982 uh, time frame that we have in the bylaw. And then the final thing I would note as sort of a reason that it should be allowed to be looked at as a part of is the proposed changes that we have coming to the bylaws. I think everyone's familiar with them. I believe you're probably going to be talking about them tonight. This whole issue would essentially go away. And I think what, what everyone is looking at in doing this is the purpose of the original bylaw and how they can effectuate that without the mess of this 1982 uh, uh, dwelling and, and footprint that we've been dealing with. So it's those three reasons. It's the purpose of the bylaw, it's the precedent of this board, and it's also the proposed changes that we're all um, hopefully gonna be working on and, and passing shortly. So, I think that covers everything that came up at the last meeting. Uh, if you have questions for me or for uh, Tom or for the architect, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, introduce, um, we'd be happy to answer any questions you have or get in deeper to the materials. But it's, it's pretty detailed. I think we put in there as much as we possibly could. Or, or I guess the first thing, number one, they're, they're putting an addition on the house. Correct. And it appears to me, based on the, uh, the new plot plan that was submitted, et cetera, uh, that they are allowed to do that by right. They have sufficient uh, lot area, lot frontage, et cetera. Uh, the zoning district will allow them to put that addition in by right. To put the addition on, yeah, as a single family resident, yes. On a single family resident, right. They're allowed to do that. And then number two, they are going to construct an accessory apartment 
that will be in part of the addition. And we'll, board members can discuss that, whatever. But I, I guess the question is, uh, going through the criteria for the accessory department in regards to the technical criteria, square footage, et cetera, uh, have you had a chance to take a look at that? And yes, I did. The, no, that, the that, that, that seems to comply. The, um, I don't have, my letter of denial isn't in my package. I don't know if you have it. No, we don't. Right. I don't know where all the information is. And I don't have the <coughs> certified plot plan with the dimensions on, on the exterior of the building. You don't. Uh, I don't. You didn't have see. That. I don't have to have that either. Yeah. But uh, the by, um, the way we've been addressing all these um, special special permits for the accessory apartments is that the 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 apartment is supposed to be part of the existing dwelling, and and in this case, I believe it's going it's going into the new addition. Right. Okay. And we we we've, we've had a number of cases before the board. Addressing that matter exactly. And I mean, uh, the restrictions. I, the, the first restrictions under four three two a two, paragraph A says the dwelling in which the accessory apartment to be located was legally occupied prior to nineteen eighty two. That's where the that's where the that's where the accessory apartment is supposed to be. And there's another there's another thing in here about ten percent of the lot coverage under paragraph B. Right. So. so um, myself and the board, we've done we've done many many cases, and we've we've always held to it that it had to be part of the existing dwelling. The purpose wasn't to uh, to construct an addition and put the uh, apartment entirely in that. Okay. But then again, on on Whittier Road, we the board did just kind of like the opposite. We allowed we allowed an accessory palm in, in a structure that doesn't even exist. Uh, All right. So right. so that 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 bothered me. But I don't know what else to say. <clears throat> well that uh, I think I think uh, you know that aspect of it certainly is up for board discussion. I yep. think that's probably what we discussed. But uh, in regards to the technical aspects of the accessory apartment square footage uh, etc. Yeah. Things such as that. No, oh, they, 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 you know, that the the addition complies yeah. um, with the requirements of the bylaw. They could build that as a right without the accessory apartment. The accessory apartment triggers the special permit in this case. Okay. <clears throat> Very good. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, do you have any comments on this? I do. I do. Okay. Uh, Glenn, re refresh my recollection, if you would. Last time that the petitioner was here. Uh, we collectively as a board made several suggestions about what the petitioner might do with the proposed plan so that he wouldn't have to come back here, correct? Simply making a, a potentially making a shared uh, kitchen facility out of the addition and probably wouldn't even have to come back here. Was, was that this case? Um, I didn't recall that. I th there, there may have been some discussion yeah. that if we were to... Okay, mm -hmm. I thought we I thought we offered some constructive criticism on that. Uh, uh, constructive, I think, advice and or suggestions. I don't think it was criticism. Uh, well, I mean, last you, time we, we, we can there. have an addition can have a proposal can have as many bedrooms and bathrooms right. or living rooms in it. The, the second kitchen would would possibly constitute an apartment. Would trigger right. the apartment. The, the apartment. The so apartment. if if separate if, dwelling if we, I think, I don't know if it was the last time we were here, because I know I, I met <coughs> on one of these meetings, but La I think. I think it was last time this petitioner was in. Okay. So um, the board, I think. Yeah, if, if there was a common kitchen in the area, then it wouldn't really be an apartment. We wouldn't even be here. All right, all right. So so I, I just wanted to reflect, refresh my recollection. Um, Mr. Wise has probably seen me more times this week than he cares to, so I'll try to keep it uh, as short and sweet as I can. Um, explain to me, in, as best you can, we've heard you very detailed, uh, you know, as we've seen earlier this week, you, you've certainly researched the ins and outs of this, and you've been providing lots of great feedback uh, during the course of the separate zoning advisory committee uh, that I serve on's uh, attempts to update the zoning bylaw. Uh, but I guess the, the first question I have is <clears throat> how does, 
other than the, the criteria, and I, I see the six criteria, how does this petition differ from the earlier petition when you were last here? Other, other than you've done, you've obviously done a lot more research. Mm -hmm. You've obviously updated some of your information, and I want to talk about that as well. But just from a, a big picture standpoint, tell me how this petition before the board, this case, differs from the last case that you had before the board. The primary differences are what we've outlined. Um, however, I would say that we did, and I was just talking, we were just talking briefly while you were asking Glenn the question, and Diane can jump in and comment as well. Um, I think one of the feedback points wasn't so much a shared kitchen as whether or not could you reconfigure the accessory inside the house to go with the interpretation of within, right? Um, and we did look at that to try and figure out whether we could make it work from a flow perspective, from an upstairs, downstairs pr perspective, from... The idea that, you know, just because it's an accessory apartment doesn't mean people, you want to cohabitate, but you don't want to give up privacy, right? You're, you still, as, as an aging couple, you want your own space. As a family, you want your own space. You want to be there to support each other, but you don't want to be on top of each other all the time. So the primary thing we looked at to try and see how we could work that is taking the existing kitchen and the existing dining room, which you can see, I think, in A4 or A3 or something like that of the, di of the thing, as the base, and then putting the bedroom upstairs with a separate new set of stairs going up there to see what we could do right above that so that that half of the house became the accessory. Um, we talked about other things, but because of the footprint of the house in 1982, it was kind of funky. You can see that in Appendix B, I believe. There was a cutout and that, that room didn't work. It also cut off the flow of the basement, which we could have figured out, but the front side wouldn't work because that cut off the flow into the upstairs. We wouldn't have access to the upstairs. We have to come up with a whole new set of stairs on the other side. Um, there was other reasons, but ultimately what we came down with from a one potentially feasible solution, and Diane jump in and tell me if I'm off base, was the existing kitchen, the existing dining room, and my daughter's room upstairs became the, the master's bedroom. The only bathroom we could figure out to work in that was the bathroom next to the existing kitchen on the, on the main floor. So that meant that you have aging parents going upstairs and downstairs in the middle of the night for the bathroom or anything else along those lines, which pre presents a problem. Um, a, because they're aging. B, because she's already got a severely osteoarthritis knee, knee problem that's just getting worse, not getting better. Um, and ultimately, we just felt like it was non-tenable. It was a non-starter. It wasn't a quality of life conversation. It wouldn't work for us as a family. Uh, so we looked at it really hard. We had mock drawings we put up, and we just decided, for, for the reasons I said, it, it, it just won't work. Okay. Um, in addition, so, you know, you know, what Mike said, just a point of clarification, we brought it in by a foot and two inches on the side, and that's why you see it went from 16.5 to 17 and three quarters, essentially. Um, so we brought that in by a foot and two inches, uh, and we reconfigured the flow of the basement as well, so it goes through the shared office as opposed to through their bedroom. So that comes out of the, the calculation from a gross perspective. And we changed the front elevation to not have a front porch and a second egress or a second entrance as a result of the conversation the last time. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, so I have a I have a couple of comments and I and I think some some different perspectives that I want to share from uh, our our from some of the things in your, in your presentation, I just want to clarify and make sure that we have all the correct information. So I, I think, uh, I, well, I don't think our last meeting we decided that uh, granting both a special permit and a, and a variance was something that we were not allowed to do. I think it was that we weren't able to, and we never have at the board, as far as I know in the history of the, the board, granted a special permit, then a variance, then a special permit on that variance, which I think, if I recall our conversation last time, which was what was required. So, so, so I, I, I don't think we've ever uh, ruled or discussed that we wouldn't, uh, as a board, issue a, a, a variance on a special permit because it's been done in other matters other than a, uh, an accessory apartment than the two cases that you've presented. There's been various other cases where, where it's happened as well. So I, I don't think that was the, the sticking point. I, I certainly appreciate your attention to detail, and I, and I can tell you, like I've said, I, I, I've seen Tom, and Tom's seen me, 
probably more times than he wants to uh, in the past couple of months. But uh, you know, I, I can I know that you're detail oriented, and I don't want to I, I don't want to diminish the fact that you put together a lot of pieces. I just want to make sure that we're working within the within the bylaw and within what I think our position is. Um, the the next issue um, is that I. Uh, as part of our review of the, the zoning bylaw, I want to I want to I want to discuss your uh, version and uh, interpretation of uh, four three two eight one, which is the, the purpose. Uh, because as as Tom will tell you, we are in the process of trying to uh, rewrite many of these provisions. Uh, to present to town meeting in the fall. And again, this is in draft form. We're still receiving community feedback. But I can tell you as part of our uh, review of the intent of these provisions when they were formed, when they were amended, when they were approved, uh, 43281 was put in place to actually limit the number of uh, instances where this is the case. Not to necessarily, well, both to encourage, but, but again, more so to limit the number of multi-family, multi-unit dwellings in town. So I, I specifically uh, disagree, and again, this may not be something that the board shares, this is just me, based upon my knowledge and research into the history of these bylaws. I, I think this is part of part of what we're what we're we're trying to change some of those things because I, I agree that in the future we may see something different. But the way the bylaw reads today, which is what we have to rule on today, this is uh, a section that is meant to allow these accessory apartments, and they're going to they're be need for much more of them as the population ages, as uh, boomerang kids, as they're usually called, come back to roost. Um, you know, so we understand that as a vision, our town needs to think about how we're going to allow that in the future. But as I sit here today, that bylaw and the intent of that section uh, was more so to limit the amount of these than necessarily to encourage them, my opinion. As far as the, um, the, the square foot analysis and the August 1, 1982 analysis, can you show me on the field card where it, where it shows us that August 1982, the, the, the building meets the criteria as set out in the, in the restrictions? It's October. October is that field card? Yeah. That's why I mentioned that we checked to confirm that no construction had been done, nothing had been changed, no alterations as best we can see between August and October. <coughs> Bear with me for a second because I didn't see it. Which, of the, of the field card submission that, that you made, the property card submission, where would I find that? Can I come over? Yeah. Thank you. Or yeah, it's easier. We had a, uh, if we all help. Next to the last page. Last page? Next to the last page. Next to the last page. <coughs> See, let me see what you what, what your base. So this, you, you you have my submission. Yeah. That's what this is from. No, this is not from my submission. I did not include this whole thing in the submission. No, this is the assessment. Right. This is the field card for the assessment. Mm -hmm. That was part of our package, wasn't it? Correct. It was. Oh, but it wasn't what he submitted. This is what uh, we included. I, I filtered I got out it. all that stuff. Got it. Got it. Got, got it. Got it. Got it. Got this it. is the October got it. All right. So that's all right. That's where. All right. right. Thank you. <coughs> all that other stuff is all the other dates. That's the only one that's October 1982. Gotcha. So I think it's Appendix B in the actual submission or something like that. It's Appendix C. Appendix C? Thank you. Yeah, B is the, the architecture drawing.
And so, uh, all right, and all right, thank you for that. No problem. And then my last comment is go through, go through your rationale again for me to help me understand why you interpret 43282B as, as not requiring the, the proposed dwelling to be within the footprint of the existing dwelling. There were three reasons. The, my initial thought on the purpose, which we... Bear with me, you were skipping around a lot. I was trying to follow along. So if I sure. could ask you to, just to repeat those. Absolutely. Uh, I, I mentioned three things. First was the purpose of the bylaw. I know that we disagree, um, and, and that's fine. But it, it does say that it encourages accessory apartments. It, it, the limitation, I think, is within the bylaw and the criteria. So it, it, in and of the conditions that have to be met is where you get your limitation. They don't want everyone to have one, understood. Um, but it explicitly says it encourages the alteration and construction. And basically what I'm getting at is to construct something is to make something new. So to make something new and to have an accessory apartment it doesn't make sense. If you construct something new, it's going to be, that apartment is going to be in what's new. The second reason was the precedent that I cited. Whittier Drive being the clearest situation. The whole thing was knocked down. It was rebuilt. It wasn't there in 82. It wasn't within the footprint. And it was allowed by this board. If we, if we can't you know, hold on to precedent and what's been done in the past, it, it's difficult. There haven't been a lot of these cases. I think there have been a total of, of four. Four in the last eight years. In the last eight years, two were allowed, the two I cite. I believe one was withdrawn, and one was sort of a flyer to see you know, what would happen if they brought it. There haven't been a lot of these. There just haven't. The only precedent that we have on decisions is what I've given you. So you know, to say this is what the board normally does with it, I respectfully disagree. I think that's the absolute strongest argument, and it's the most difficult to get around. The two that have been allowed are almost identical in most ways to this petition. So that's my strongest argument. And the third is the zoning change. They're trying to make changes to clean up this bylaw, for lack of a better term. It's difficult. It's something that the town knows we need. We have an aging population. It's something that the residents want for situations exactly like this. And changes are being made that would make this petition much, much easier to get past this board. Thank you. I think I'm finished for now. Okay. Thank you, David. Uh, John, uh, any comments? Uh, yeah, a couple. Okay. Um, you have the floor. Well, first of all, I'd like to, uh, I think I'll, I'll first start with the aspect of presence. First of all, there is no presence. The board in the years that I've been a member has not let one case determine the outcome of another case. Although we take that into account, and each you do not have any two cases on the cases that on hearings that I have sat they were exactly alike, with the exceptions of the teardown and rebates, which is a 6-3 situation. Those are carbon copies in most cases. If they meet the criteria, they're very specific. Um, if it meets all the criteria, you go forward with it. But on all the other cases, um, precedent is, is not determined does not determine the outcome of a, a, another case or another hearing before the board. I'll just say that. Um, I will say that uh, in the Belmont property, um, the vote was 4-1. I was the one. And the reason for that is because we were establishing basically a two-family structure. Even though it was called an accessory apartment, it was a two-family. Um, the second one that you're talking about, Whittier Road, uh, Whittier Road was a was very much different than this particular case. And I'll give you an example at the end. Um, and that was the way it was laid out, number one. And um, we talked about uh, the shared kitchen in that particular case. Um, and I can't remember because I, I, I asked for the minutes, but that wasn't in the minutes. 
So I can't go back and reconstruct that unless I go back and get a tape. And I didn't have enough time to go back and get a tape. Um, let me go on to purpose. Um, so to what? Purpose. Um, I think David adequately covered that, but I would say that in 1982, um, for that town meeting, this bylaw, which took effect August, of, I think it's 10th, um, I happened to be around. I happened to be around as a zoning board member, and I happened to be around as a town meeting member. And that particular, uh, this particular uh, bylaw took virtually the entire meeting time frame to get through. And the purpose, let me go back and tell you about the purpose, because I'm a big purpose person. Uh, the intent and purpose of the bylaw. The intent and purpose of the bylaw in 1982 was that there are a large number of larger family homes in the, in the, in the town. Um, that you could easily get an accessory apartment um, into between the 400 and the 750 square feet. Um, the intention was that no more than 10% of accessory apartments to these homes that would qualify would actually um, be given as a special permit to reduce the possibilities that you would be creating um, open market on creation of two family structures. Because as, and I, I've already told David my concern about the new accessory apartment uh, bylaw is that anybody can do anything they want and create two family structures in single family resident areas, zones in the town because you don't need anything to do that, just like what you're doing. Um, but we have to go by what's in the bylaw today. And I have some questions, I, I have some concerns about the validity of the calculations that you put in here. I'm not gonna go over them right now. I, I want other board members to, to react to that too. But my last thing is, if I had an aging uh, family member that I wanted to make the accessory apartment for, who I know had orthopedic problems, why would I put her bedroom or his bedroom on the second floor, which they would have to navigate the stairs to get up there. I don't care if it's even two stairs, but you're just talking about putting the base of the apartment, the, the base of the apartment on one floor and the bedroom on, on a floor above that. And I can't understand why you would do that. Can we address, address that? Certainly. That's exactly why we could not fit it in the existing in the footprint. If you look at the drawings as they are for what we're proposing, the bedroom will be on the main floor with the living room, with the bathroom, with the kitchen. It will be on one floor. Everything will be on one floor. And that's exactly what you're saying is exactly what we were going through and debating and discussing, whether we could or that it made any sense. And we agree with you, it makes no sense. But then I have to go back to the calculations then. I thought in your presentation, counselor, that you mentioned that it was on the second floor. When I was reading the plans, I thought that it was on the first floor, but then you said it was on the second floor. So the only person I said when we, to, to answer Mr. Turnio, I'm pronouncing that properly. Okay. Question about, uh, sorry about that, uh, was you know the consideration of did you take into account our, our feedback from last time? That's when the second floor came up. Was that was the way we could make the thing fit? And, but we agree, just like you do, that there's that doesn't make any logical sense to do that. But the intention was not to build on so that you could create that situation. That is with whatever might be created in new bylaw coming up. And town meeting and exec will have to deal with that when it comes forward. Can you clarify uh, that? I'm not understanding the, the point there. Well, you're asking, you're asking in essence, whether it's, <laughs> I saw the uh, proposal, whether it's detached or attached um, proposal that you can build on uh, to an existing structure and create from that resulting existing, existing structure, you can create a new accessory apartment, which again, opens up the opportunity for anybody who has a single family tape right now to build it into a colonial um, with an accessory apartment. The accessory apartments in the town um, are not referred to by realtors as accessory apartments. And you know that. They're called what? In-laws. In-laws. So my question goes back to what you put in here tonight. 
in the area, in your area, mm -hmm. there is an in-law apartment. So That's my right. question to you, are you willing are, are you willing to give the location of that and are you asking for enforcement from the building inspector as to the validity of that in-law apartment? And I'll just stop right there and let, let the board. But my real concern is that we are, by granting this, uh, we are, in essence, guaranteeing or or precedent setting, as counselor said, uh, any two, any single family can be created into a two family for the purposes of obtaining an accessory apartment or in-law apartment, which two years, five years, six years down the road is gonna be a two family. And we've had that happen before on some of the earlier ones. That's why for years, people haven't come in because we were denying them because we saw that it was happening. I think the Similar to Whittier, uh, we would be in agreement with any restriction the board would want to put on with regard to rentals. But see, that the problem, the problem there is, how do you enforce that? Deed are we going to are we going to we going to say that there's going to be a register for all accessory apartments in the town of Reading that get gets checked every year for by the assessor to val verify that they are um, legally occupied by a member of the family? Um, and, 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 and I think and that's the same we, for any case. If there's someone, there's someone that's that is hired and paid to do that. I mean, the bylaws are the bylaws. If it's if it's allowed, and we agree to a restriction. I'm, I'm just saying that there's there's a potential. My answer would be yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, John, you asked the question, where where is the accessory in your neighborhood? He's here, actually. Okay. Richard, right across the street, 186, has an accessory. Okay. In neighborhood. And uh, I, I I wasn't going to say it, but I, I will say it. Um, your interpretation of the within the existing structure, the within does not appear in the um, in the language of the bylaw. Correct. What does appear is the um, phrase of which it is a part, which to me, if you look it up in the dictionary, is basically the same thing. They didn't use the word within; they used of which it is a part. And it will be. It will be a part of the of the existing of the dwelling. Not at, not until we give a special permit um, for the construction of uh, a, a larger a larger unit, a variance on Part B of the accessory bylaw, and then a, uh, um, a special permit on the accessory bylaw request. Why would Part B need a variance? Well, that's what you're asking for right now. No, I was saying I don't think it's necessary. That, that was oh, the comment. Well, Okay, then. If we interpret the bylaw th the way I presented, it's part of the structure, as just as Whittier was. Okay. So the variance isn't necessary. Okay, that's, that's for the board to discuss. Uh, right, no, that, I'm just saying that, that's my take on it. Okay, okay. That's all I have for now. Mm -hmm. Okay, John. Thank you. Uh, Sai. Uh, well, the first comment I really would like yeah. to make is uh, you have obviously put an awful lot of effort into this project. I just want you to family. know, it, at least from this member's viewpoint, it's recognized and I commend you for it. Okay, it's got a lot of a lot of detail here. Uh, you just ended with the comment that I was going to ask you. That is, you said a fire variance would not be required, and I was going to ask you to try to get a little bit more precise in exactly why you feel a variance is not required in this case. Well, all I can do, uh, and again, uh, I'm not trying to you know, jam precedent <coughs> down your throat, but all I can do is look at what the board's done. Four cases, two decisions that I can read. Yeah. If, if that's not gonna be, if, if part of is considered a new structure that has an accessory apartment, I, I can't see having to go any further with the argument. It's, it's a new structure that will contain an accessory apartment, same as what I've seen in, in doing the research on what the board's done in the past. I, I can only interpret the bylaw as you folks do based on what's been done. It's really the only way to do it. We can all read it and we can all think, hey, this is what it should be, or that, you know, they're going through that now. But how do we know exactly what can be done and why? We look at what's been done in the past. You know, if there were 100 of these cases, and every one of them came down in the favor of what we're looking for, I think the board would say, you know, this is a slam dunk. Well, 100% of them have. 
but there's only been two. It's not something that comes up often. Mm. So I think that's how you have to interpret the bylaw based on the past, and it, make, it makes sense. I mean, it's not, it's not uh, to me, it makes complete sense. It's part of the new structure. You know, there are gonna be few in-laws or accessories because of the other restrictions. It's gotta be small. It's gotta be a certain square footage. It's related to the original square footage. You know, houses that were constructed in 1982. There are a lot of restrictions, and that's why we have a limited amount, or we could have a limited amount. That's why you don't see this every day. If everyone wanted to do it, and had the ability to do it, they would. But I think those limitations would restrict much more than, than the board's concerned about. The other thing is that uh, there's a lot of calculation here vis-a-vis -vis square footage and gross area, all that kind of stuff. And I don't know, have you had the opportunity to see what we were just given before this, at the start of this meeting? I, I was given it a minute beforehand, so not in detail, no. Which basically takes issue with what you yep. have come up with. I read through it. Okay, so it raises the question of what is right, what is wrong, what is proper, what is improper, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's something that we really haven't had an opportunity to review with detail. We've got six pages of stuff in, I'm sure we'll talk about that when we get on Friday. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'll deal with that at that time. Uh, I would agree with you that if you look at some of the other cases, it appears to be precedent setting, in some, and, and John alludes to the fact that we don't like to deal with that kind of stuff and talk in that way because, you know, it does lead to other issues. Uh, but uh, it's something that we cannot lose sight of and set aside. And I'm just going to let it sit at that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Eric, uh, comments? Just a few. Um, I happen to agree with you, Michael, that you do not need a variance. It's, you know, I know that the board, you know, they've maybe construed it in other cases um, that it has to be within that footprint. My reading of the bylaw, I don't, I don't see a way that you can uh, hold us to that. You know, I, I agree with you that, you know, no, you, you don't need that variance. Um, in terms of the square footage, I think that's probably the next discussion that we'll come to with the, um, the public uh, forum opening. But I will note that it looks like, and I, I think we just got this today, but the, um, uh, the dispute about the square footage, it seems to exclude the unfinished basement, but if I remember my um, review of your materials, it looks like you do have a partially finished basement with uh, wallpaper and, and paneling. Um, so, I guess I just wanted to throw that out there, just anticipating, you know, what, uh, you know, discussion on those calculations that, you know, it, it seems from the assessor, from the assessor's car that that was in place at least as of October, and I, I think, you know, we have to be reasonable, and I know that it's as of August, but you know, we've got September, October, it's two months afterwards, we've got some really credible evidence there, so. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Thank you, Eric. Well, uh, <coughs> my opinion on this, uh, and I, I think what we've done in the past is, I think on these when we've given a variance and a special permit for the for the accessory apartments before, the thought behind that was that they needed the variance because they hadn't met that criteria of uh, building within the 1982 footprint. And that's why they required the variance. And then they got a special permit to construct the accessory apartment uh, on that. And I know we've had differing opinions on the board in regards to the interpretation of the 1982 criteria. Mm -hmm. Uh, on that, whether it should be within the 1982 construction, or in my personal opinion was it, it the the site was occupied and the house was occupied legally occupied in 1982. Uh, after that, additions were made, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It can be done, and that's where we have said, well, then that would require a variance, if need be, because it wasn't built within the 1982. 
footprint. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where they were coming from on that. Uh, may, I, may I just make one brief comment? Sure. Where, where both of the, um, the prior cases that I cited, their variance was to Section A, though, correct? So the variance didn't have to do with the 1980 the A part of. Right, it had to do with the, so there, I'll point that specifically since I've mm -hmm. been intimately involved in it for so long. The two previous cases, the variances were to Section A. Although you don't seem to have it, Glenn's objection is to Section B for us. Mm -hmm. um, both of which are around 1982, but clearly he, right. nobody can make the argument that our house didn't exist in 1982, so A, is null and void, we passed that one. The only question then becomes p the part of or within, and in the readings of your decisions, you reviewed the other criteria after you reviewed A for those other ones, so we view that as the precedent that we discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I just wanted to, to take a quick look at that. Okay, it was to A, the dwelling in which the accessory apartment needs to be located was legally occupied prior to 19, outstanding oh, these long four city five. Okay, yeah, no, I see, I see what you're saying. That, that was, and I, and I okay, I, it, it's almost like the two of them are tied together. Yep. Uh, obviously, the accessory apartment, if it's constructed, like in your particular case, would not have been legally occupied in 1982. The dwelling of which it was part. The dwelling was. of which it was part was. And, and it's, it's again, it's, it's, it's an interpretation. Yep. You're playing words, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's what the reference was in the other criteria was that yes. it certainly wasn't mm -hmm. occupied in 1982 where the accessory apartment was owned. The one thing I noticed. And I, I just wanted, yeah, that's what I was thinking where we were coming from as a board. Right. When we did that before, yeah. I mean, I, that's why I was when I first saw the denial on on B, I figured, well, yeah. every one is going to have this argument about is it yeah. part of. But neither one of the cases did. Right. Th there was not even discussion. It must have just been, well, part of is part of. You can build it. You there's, know, there's discussion. Yeah. You there's, don't see it in the minutes. There's yeah. nothing in the minutes and nothing in the decisions right. other than <coughs> other than to say we went through all the criteria right. and it was met. And uh, in regards to, I know my, in my personal opinion, limitations have, have been brought up too in regards to the member. And uh, number one, I, I do believe that the way the bylaws are written, that they certainly at that time wanted to encourage accessory apartments, whether at that time they were accessory apartment was also in-law apartments under that umbrella, and I think it is. Uh, so be it. Uh, I think the limitation is clear in their, in number one, in the restrictions that they do, uh, uh, as you brought up, but also I think the limitations are clear when they go to the 10% yes. maximum uh, in town. And once you've hit that threshold, uh, there can no longer be any more accessory apartments approved. And I don't think we've reached that threshold. We're far from it. And I know we've asked that question on past accessory apartments, and we've always been told, no, no, we're far from it, so I don't. Well, the intention of all of that was yeah. the affordable housing. Act. Right. So once we reach our threshold of 10%, there's no need for the granting of that. Not right. that they couldn't be granted, right. it's just that you've reached the, the threshold, so you don't need to go any further. You don't need to do it. Right. I think Not that's right. the biggest governor of, you know, <laughs> you say everyone would do it, everyone can't do it. Right. You know, it's, that would be like saying, well, they're going to make you put as much 40B as they want to have in the town. You know, it won't say, oh, it's going to be everywhere, but it can't be. Yeah. It's, that's probably the... Because they don't care. Right. Well, you, because there's that limitation as well. So, uh, so uh, on my personal aspect, personal aspect, as I said when I started out, I believe certainly the, the addition to the house can be built by right, uh, they've met all. It's 
setbacks. Uh, it's a legal lot, uh, a legal conforming lot. And number two, then they can build the, the you have the accessory apartment within a house now that is had an addition put on and I'm looking at the path of the, it was legally occupied in 1982, but the portion without the accessory apartment <coughs> or with the accessory apartment was not constructed in 1982, and that's where the variance would come in prior to then the granting of a special permit for an accessory apartment. Uh, I think we've heard the board members. We can certainly come back to them here uh, afterwards. Mr. Chairman, may I ask one yes. question? So I, I'm just trying to uh, follow what you're saying. I, I think what you're saying is you're bringing it back to Section A. In other words, you're looking at the 1982 as legally occupied in 1982. Yes. yes. Got it. Okay, thank yeah. you. That's the way I look at it. The, the, it was a legally occupied structure in 1982. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. Uh, at this particular time, I will uh, open the meeting up to uh, public comment. Uh, if you care to uh, comment on this, raise your hand and uh, we'll recognize you. And if you give us your uh, name and uh, who you're representing, if you're representing a resident and their address. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody who would like to speak? Sir. Good evening. My name is Kenneth DeMora. Attorney at the law firm of Demora Smith, and I represent uh, the direct abutters to the property, Michael and Leanne Webb. Thank you. And I have submitted uh, what I had planned to just use as my presentation for tonight, right. but I thought that since they were such pearls of wisdom, you might all want to keep them and bring them home. Um, my clients object to the grant of a special permit and the variance in this matter. And the primary reason for that is because that the special permit and the variance also proposes the construction of a second driveway in the house that's going in front of the part where the accessory unit will be and the taking down of a very large public shade tree. And that shade tree and that area is the area that immediately butts, abuts the Webb's property. Uh, I, what I went what I did was I went through the various criteria that the board uh, has in the zoning bylaw and pointed out and highlighted the ones that I believe uh, the petitioners fall short on. They don't fall short on all of them, obviously, but they do fall short on some of them, and I would like to talk about those with you tonight. And then the second thing I'm going to talk about is the whole notion about uh, whether or not, if they don't meet any of the criteria, they can somehow still get what they want by getting this board to grant them a variance from those specific provisions. And my argument tonight is that they can't. And the reason they can't is because the hardship that they are alleging uh, entitles them to a variance is not a permissible hardship. Under the case law in Massachusetts, about what a permissible hardship would be. Now I'll talk about that a little more uh, when I get to that section of my, my presentation. Uh, I, I agree with some of the members of this board having reviewed the bylaw that the bylaw is not really intended to open the floodgates or encourage additional housing in the town of Reading. What it really does is it take, gives that right, but then takes it back with the other hand. And how, that they, the, how the bylaw does that is it says right in it that it is designed for a, limit, for a limited number of units, number one. Number two, it sets out very specific six factors that should be considered as, and it says in the bylaw, at a minimum, those factors must be met. At a minimum, each of those factors must be met. And then the third one, again, as the chair pointed out, is the 10% rule where you can only have a certain, up to 10% uh, uh, of the single family homes in, in the town can have the accessory unit. So I, I think that while the town recognizes the need for accessory apartments, it has, the town meeting has cautioned this board that we agree that there is a need, but that uh, need has to be with very limited circumstances 
and regulation. The proposed accessory apartment in this case doesn't meet the minimum standard in the bylaw in a couple of different ways. First off is the debate we've been having a little bit about whether or not the proposed accessory apartment must be within the dwelling as it existed in August of 1982. I think that the board has it right that the, the, the bylaw couldn't be clear. It says a dwelling in which the accessory apartment is to be located has to be in existence and occupied as of August 1st, 1982. So that's subsection A, and I believe the other subsections also address that. Another reason why I think uh, that is the correct interpretation is because if you look at the bylaw as a whole, it says right in it that we are trying to preserve the single family characteristics of the neighborhood while allowing for these accessory uses. And so the way we're gonna do that is make sure if you have an accessory apartment, it's within the existing building that you already have. And I believe that the person here tonight who has an existing in-law apartment has it within the existing structure and not one that was added. Uh, so I don't believe that the design complies with subsection A uh, of, the, of, of, of the accessory use bylaw. Um, with respect to subsection B, which is the calculation of the gross square footage, uh, I can tell you that when I looked at the assessor's card that was provided by uh, the Wises, uh, what I saw was that they were being very selective about what parts of the gross or adjusted square footage they wanted to use in their calculation. For example, uh, the card says that with respect to the basement, unfinished basement, there is 858 square feet, and then there's an adjusted area of 172, which I think the, what the Wise's position is represents 172 square feet of finished space in the basement, which therefore can be counted towards the gross square footage and isn't part of the unfinished basement. Number one, that's not what these figures mean at all. These are assessor's figures for what the value, the adjusted value of that unfinished basement would be for assessor's purposes, not for purposes of determining square footage. Number two, it's curious that he takes the credit for the 172 square feet there. But then when there's an adjustment made for the second floor, it is half story. The half story gross is 858 square feet. The adjusted growth, the adjusted space for that same space is 429 square feet. And yet in his calculations, he includes all of the 858 square feet, not the adjusted amount. So if he wants the benefit of using the adjusted calculations in connection with his square footage for the basement, he should also, when he's calculating and using uh, the measurements for the upstairs, see that that adjustment is also applied. And that would significantly reduce uh, the gross square footage of the building, of the, of the dwelling, of the dwelling, which is what the definition requires here. So, the way we calculated it was simply to add the amount of square footage in the dwelling, the part where people live. The first floor, which was 1,012 square feet, and the second floor, which is the 858 square feet, to get to the figure that's in my letter of, I believe it was 1,800, approximately 1,800 square feet, 1,870 square feet. That is the area, the way I interpret, the way I read subsection B, of the bylaw, you take the dwelling, the, the, the places where people live, and you take, uh, or the gross square footage of that, and you take out from that any unfinished areas uh, or any accessory uses, like a porch, for example, or a garage. So that's where I got the 1870, and if you take 1870, one third of that is 623 square feet, and he doesn't still meet the criteria, which is why he may be seeking a variance on subsection B, because I think that's what the application says. We're seeking a variance on subsection B. 
And I'll get to the reason why they're not entitled to that variance. I haven't proven they're entitled to that variance in a minute. But just with respect to whether or not this particular subsection is complied with, I don't think that they can establish the square footage necessary to meet the gross square footage in order to get the accessory in it. The next sections that I believe apply here relate to section subsection E, which is the subsection that deals with off-street parking. There hasn't been any talk tonight about this. But in fact, the bylaw says, let's pull it out, the exact length. All motor vehicles owned or maintained by occupants of the building in which the accessory apartment is located shall be parked off the street. And the location and appearance of all additional off-street parking shall not adversely affect the adjoining properties of the neighborhood or the single family appearance of the neighborhood in general. And this is a key one, will cause no change to the front yard parking, if any, as it existed on August 1st, 1982. Well, we all know, just look at the drawings that they've submitted. They clearly intend to change the appearance of the front yard parking area on this property. They want to add a whole other driveway on the other side of their property, which is completely opposite from the side where they live, uh, where their existing driveway is. So it changes the existing parking area. It adds to it. It changes it from August of 82. And by doing that, it also affects the appearance of whether or not this is a single family house. Now you've got two driveways. What are people going to think when they're, walking, when they're driving down the street? There's two apartments in here. There's two separate houses in here. And additionally, it does have an adverse effect on the adjoining properties. Take a look at my uh, submission. There's a beautiful tree right there where they're going to put this driveway. And they're going to... Well, they want to take that tree down. This is a scenic road. It's a designated scenic road in Reading. And what they want to do is knock that tree down and put an asphalt driveway there instead. To me, that affects the adjoining properties, and it affects the abutters. And it's a big concern of the neighborhood. And, uh, and Mr. and Mrs. Webb, who are the, uh, live in the house right next door to that tree. Now. Uh, there was a hearing um, by community planning where they where they approved uh, the takedown of the tree because they have jurisdiction over the scenic road there. Actually, they didn't approve the takedown of the tree. They uh, approved, I think, the curb cut in the area. And there was some discussion, and I believe the town engineer submitted a memorandum saying that it wasn't a public shade tree. Well, I had begged to differ with the town engineer. He's not qualified to make that determination. Chapter 87 of the Mass General Laws defines a public shade tree as a tree that is on the public way or bordering the public way. And if you look at this tree, it's clearly bordering the public way. And that same statute doesn't give the authority for the town engineer to make that determination. Instead, it gives it to the tree warden in the town. And there's no evidence in this case that the tree warden has made any such determination about that tree. Be that as it may, even if all those other boards had the authority and did what they could do, that doesn't mean that taking down that tree doesn't affect negatively or adversely this neighborhood and doesn't give this board the right to say in its own findings that regardless, if you want the special permit, you must meet the criteria of subsection E relating to off-street parking, and you can't do that the way you want to do it here. You can't do it by putting in a second driveway that tears down that tree, that changes the characteristics of this from a single family into a two family, and that adds more parking than was there in the front yard prior to August 1st of 1982. So under subsection E, I don't think they have the right. So in order to get that, they probably would need a variance to do that. Again, as I'll tell you in a few minutes, they don't have the evidence to get a variance. I think that that covers the reasons that they are not entitled to the special permit. The 
gross uh, square footage, the, the fact that the accessory use is not in the apartment, is not, I'm sorry, it's not in the existing <laughs> dwelling, and all of the problems that they have with the off street park that I've just referred to. Now, to the extent that the criteria have not been met, I think the board does have the authority to issue a variance. By the way, I do. I, I also want to address, and I don't know if now is the time to do it or after I'm done with my initial presentation, some of the points about uh, that, that uh, Mr. Conway, Conway made uh, about the precedent that this board has in the past. Maybe now is a good time to do that. And 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 he, they did they did make a very very good presentation and, and submitted a lot of information. But let's look at the detail. Just as somebody on the board said a few minutes ago, let's look at the detail of those decisions. The first decision, the 2012 decision, does not support the claim that uh, that the interpretation is that. Uh, an accessory use can be outside of the dwelling. The reason for that is because there's a specific finding in that decision that says, we find that it is within the dwelling. So someone on the board must have seen something in those plans and then convinced the other members of the board to make that specific finding. Number two, there was no variance granted in that decision whatsoever. That entire decision was a special permit decision. So the idea that you can, you know, that there's a special permit versus a variance and that that support, that case supports it, does nothing of the kind. That case only deals with special permit. The decision in that case is only a special permit, not a variance decision. The second case, the 2013-14 case, which many of you on the board probably were wrestling with when you had that case, is the one where they tore down the house and put up a new one. Interestingly, when you read that decision and you focus on the details, this board did not grant a special permit for the accessory use outside of the building. In fact, it granted a variance. It only granted a variance for the, for the house, to be, to, for the accessory use. So when you read that decision, again, I don't think that decision stands for the proposition that you can have a, an accessory use apartment outside of a dwelling and still have it comply with the bylaw. That's not what that case says. What it says, in fact, is you don't have a house that complies with the bylaw, so we're going to have to give you a variance to let you do that. But the reasons that this board gave the variance in that case, which are the reasons that, that Mr. Wise wants one here, unfortunately, had someone appealed that case, I think the board would have been overturned. The reasoning in that case was that the health of the owner and the financial circumstances were such that it would be good, that it was a hardship for them. There was a financial hardship and a health hardship, and that was the find that were the findings in that case as to why the variance was permissible. Unfortunately, case law and the statute itself of variance in Massachusetts says that the only hardships that are applicable are hardships owing to the land not hardships owing to the financial circumstances of the owner of the property, not hardships that, that owe to the health of the owner of the property. And I have two cases that I've cited in my paper that both specifically say that very point. They say, it is correct that the health of Bruin's father, in this case, Bruin was the, uh, was the person applying for the variance. And this is an appeals court case from 1984. It is correct that the health of Bruin's father and his financial situation and any other considerations unrelated to the underlying real estate are, re are irrelevant to the board's inquiry on the question of substantial hardship. So all of the evidence that's been presented relating to Mr. Wise or Mrs. Wise's parents is completely irrelevant as to whether or not they're entitled to a variance. And that is not a hardship that this board can consider. The fact that his parents or her parents may not have the financial means to have their own apartment somewhere else, again, regrettable, 
but not relevant to this board's decision about whether or not a variance can be granted. In Massachusetts, it's very difficult to get a variance, and it's supposed to be, because the idea is you've got zoning bylaws, the town passed them for a reason, and you really have to establish that because of something unique about your land, those zoning bylaws are causing you a hardship. Well, that's not the issue here. We know that the land is usable. They have a single family home on it right now. They're using it. And the cases that I've cited in my presentation all say that, that you have to show that the topography of the land, the shape of the land, something about the land is creating such a hardship that, you, that it renders the property essentially useless if the zoning bylaws are, are uh, enforced. And you don't have that here at all. So there is no basis for this board to grant any variances. And because the wises cannot meet the six the criteria, at least three of them that I could see, for the issuance of a special permit, and then and can't prove that they that they have a hardship that entitled them to a variance to those specific subsections, this board has to vote to deny the petition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else who would like to? Uh, okay, I will ask uh, the wise, uh, the petitioner, if uh, they would like. If and if we can keep it, you know, I'll keep it brief. I'm just going to brief. Uh, yeah, yeah, rebuttal to that. To any the specific of the points that were made, I'll, I'll just address sure. as I see them. First and foremost is uh, uh, council's incorrect with regard to the 2013 decision. Uh, a variance was granted under 4.3.2.8.2a of the zoning bylaw, um, so it was a variance for an accessory apartment. Uh, and with regard to hardship, if you look at the Board of Appeals, uh, um, great decision because it lays out what the petitioner sought and what you based it on. Uh, so if you look at the circumstance, circumstances relating to the soil condition, shape, and topography, uh, the reason is that Mr. Ingram had a non-conforming lot, that it didn't, the home didn't provide enough workable space for an accessory apartment, and he further explained it's most economically feasible to reconstruct the original home making it large enough to incorporate the proposed accessory apartment. It's exactly the same uh, variance argument, which I don't think we need, but I think that we're making. Uh, and then with regard to the hardship, uh, the hardship here is that they wanted to have a, a, a family environment where the parents could live with the children and provide care, that there was financial hardship with both the folks that were gonna be living there and the, and the folks that own the home. Those are the exact, essentially, reasons that we are seeking a variance, which again, I don't think we need, but. Um, to that point, we certainly meet the criteria. And, and with regard to uh, Section E, uh, I don't think it came up because I, I don't think it, it's, uh, it's, it's pertinent in this situation, but I will discuss it. Um, what that section says that all motor vehicles owned or maintained by the occupants of the accessory apartment shall be par parked off the street and the location and appearance of all additional off-street parking shall not affect adversely the character of the neighborhood. So what basically it's saying is, you can't change the parking up that was there, which we're not doing. What was there in 82 is what's staying there now. We're gonna add additional off-street parking for the accessory apartment, which is exactly what Section E contemplates. We're not changing the 82 parking, we're adding additional parking for the accessory apartment as you're supposed to uh, by the bylaw. And, and with regard to E, just a couple other quick points. Um, the, the scenic nature of the neighborhood has already been dealt with by CBDC. They found that it wouldn't adversely affect the character or quality of, of this as a scenic growth. And the, the shade tree is a non-starter. It was determined by the town engineer, uh, who is allowed to make that determination based on the statute. The tree warden can delegate to whomever he wants to, to make that decision. It was made by the town. He could go out there tomorrow and cut it down. It's got nothing to do with the driveway. Um, the driveway has to be there. The selectmen have approved the curb cut there. And engineering has said, this is the best place for it. So the driveway's gotta go where the driveway's gotta go. Trust me, we tried. We looked at every option as far as putting this driveway someplace else and not taking the tree down. We went to the abutters and said, we'll put in a row of trees, we'll pay for it, you pick them. You know, whatever you want to sort of pretty this up, we'll do it. Um, and to say that, well, it's gonna look like it's a two family because there are two driveways. Drive around that neighborhood. In our submission, I think we've showed pictures of 
maybe five or six homes that have two driveways. I mean, this is a common, common thing in Reading. It's, it's not at all out of the ordinary. This driveway, just like other colonials, two driveways, one for parking, one for you know, whatever people are gonna do with it. It's not leading to a front door. It's not directly you know, in front of a, a second apartment. It looks like a colonial with two driveways. We have two driveways everywhere. We have circular driveways everywhere. That's not uncommon. Uh, you know, to say having a second driveway adversely affects an abutter, I think is a stretch. You know, if you go down that street, every person that's got a driveway, it's, you know, it's three, four, five feet off the neighbor's property. Um, all the setbacks are made. Their driveway is another probably 12 or 15 feet away from that. Um, honestly, I, you know, I think they're, they're sort, of, sort of grasping at that, and I think the issue has been dealt with by CPDC, and um, we're certainly meeting the bylaw. Thank you. The calculations, I think, yeah. maybe we should talk a little bit about. And uh, to be honest, yeah. math is not my strong suit, and, and, and Tom was, was the number cruncher. So if, if you're comfortable, would you address those points? I'm comfortable. Um, can I maybe say something quickly? Or? That's fine. Go ahead. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer or a politician, so excuse me. And then there's a lot of legalities. If, if, yeah. if, if, if you could oh, I'm sorry. identify I'm yourself. I'm, I'm an I'm a butter of this, of this property. Mm -hmm. I live at 189 South Street. On the, on the other side. Okay. Can you just say your name again? Gary Jufri. Can you spell your last sure. name? Sure. J U F F R E. So, I mean, the legalities of it, and I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of different interpretations of right. the bylaws, which I don't understand or, or pretend to understand, other than um, there's some precedence, and I guess there's a disagreement of whether precedent means anything. To me, I guess it would mean a little. It's the kind of saying, we're going to say yes here and change our minds here or change, yeah, have a different interpretation. So you guys all need to figure that out. Um, but this gentleman was speaking um, for the neighborhood, um, but you don't speak for me. So you may speak for, for that gentleman who, who I've never met before. But um, from my perception, the, 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 it doesn't sound like it's gonna adversely affect the, 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 the neighborhood, the, the, the way it looks. It seems like I've seen a model of a home it looks like it's going to be a big, beautiful, new constructed colonial house right next to mine. That makes me feel pretty good. You know, I like having nice homes in a neighborhood. Uh, as far as him bringing in his in-laws to live there, I think that's wonderful. It sounds like it's been done before. It sounds like there's limitations on how many can be done in Reading, which I respect, and I think that, that should be looked at. Uh, as far as the square footage, which you guys are about to talk about, i got to take a step back. But as far as my perception of the view of the neighborhood, um, the new park that went up uh, across the street uh, at Sturgis Park, which Tom was involved with, uh, contributed to, donated to. They have to cut down um, a couple trees there, public trees, not on someone's personal pro uh, property. Um, you know, and, and that's unfortunate. However, I look across the street now, and we have this new beautiful park, and new trees were planted. So sometimes you do have to take down old things to build up new nicer things. So again, for, for my vision, I, I welcome his in-laws, I welcome a new beautiful house in our neighborhood. I think it looks great. Thank you. Uh, uh, do you want me to just ask if there's anybody else who would like to speak? No, uh, I'm fine. No, Thank you're you. fine. Anybody? All set. Okay. If uh, we have nobody else, then. Uh, Sure. Mr. Wise can uh, you <laughs> thank you for the okay. things I don't know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, we put together for to benefit us, and, and uh, we were going to do a PowerPoint, but I said it's probably overkill. Uh, the good thing is it contains the analysis that uh, Tom and I did. Would you guys like to look at that section? It's the same thing that's in the paper, but it's just laid out maybe a little bit more clearer, it shows exactly the alignment to Appendix C and things along those lines. If you want uh, page, page four and five, the gross and net square footage yes, calculations? Yes, sir. I think we've got them. Okay. Okay, uh, so. Unless any, th uh, any no. other board members need any. I think we're okay looking at what we've got yeah. here. So, as we've talked about briefly before, um, we, we looked at the 1982 assessor's document. Um, and there's, what it says there, and I think one of the key points here is there's a difference between gross and net, pure and simple. In a cape, you have a much different number for gross on the top four than you do for net. Gross is wall to wall, regardless of how many crawl space or otherwise there is, it's outside wall to outside wall. Net takes into account and removes all the crawl space that you can't use and things along those lines, 
right? So fundamentally, that's what you're seeing in this document, is a difference between gross and net. What you have there in, um, the, in, the, in the document is the gross for the town record, directly tied to Appendix C, which is the assessor's record as of October 1982. Going down the line, 1,012, 130, 374, 858, 858. Directly from the assessor's record. You can see a direct parallel between the two if you put those two things side by side. And all I've done in this, if you want to see it, is do, is do that. Okay, so I'm happy to hand this one out. Mm -hmm. The next set is the net. And this isn't selective use of, of it necessarily, but that's what that next line is, the net of what is usable space. So in the case of the, of the base floor, there is no crawl space. There's no net. There's no gross to remove because gross more or less equals net. So that's why you have 1,012 there. If you go across then to the fully enclosed or finished enclosed porch, it's part of the house. It's not an accessory use, it's, it's part of the house. That has a net of 91 versus the gross of 130, okay? The, the, the FGR, looking up online, FGR stands for finished garage. The finished garage had a gross of 374 and a net of 150. There was finished garage. It wasn't unfinished garage, it was finished garage, which meant there was usable space in there. The finished half story is where the Cape versus Colonial and all the crawl space and all the stuff that's unique about a Cape comes in, and that's where there's a big difference, 858 for 429. And the last thing is the unfinished basement. The great majority is unfinished. However, as is noted in the notes, there is paneling and wallpaper, as Mr. Hagstrom noted, there's paneling and wallpaper in the basement indicating a finished portion of the basement. And the finished portion of the basement is the 172 square feet. So, to get to gross, the bylaw says that you have to, the gross floor area of the one family dwelling of which it is part, exclusive of any garage, unfinished, so the unfinished portion of the basement, all of the garage, whether finished or unfinished, the unfinished portion of the basement, any shed or accessory use structure attached to or part of one family dwelling. So those are exclusive. So the garage, net or gross is excluded. That's why it's zero and you see in that, in that thing. The base area, the main floor, fully gross, you get the full gross of that because it's a gross calculation we're talking about, not the net calculation. That's the 112. The enclosed porch, again, it's a gross calculation, not a net calculation, so you get the 130 of the enclosed porch. The half story, Again, a gross versus net, so you get the 858. And finally, the finished, unfinished basement has a finished portion, so you get to include that in the gross calculation as well, which gives you the 172, which leads to the 2172 divided by 3 to 724. That's where those numbers came from. It's all about gross versus net. Respectfully, I think they're misunderstanding net and what those numbers are. Okay, thank you. With all due respect to Mr. Wise and his calculations, none of which I dispute, the regulation in Section B that he's talking about doesn't have the word net anywhere. It says one-third of the gross floor right. area. It doesn't use net for anything. And so what the board should do is look at the net of everything. That is the living, that's the dwelling where people live. People don't live in a porch with no heat. The porch is a porch, it's not the dwelling. And I think that's what this refers to when it says you are supposed to look at the dwelling exclusive of garage, unfinished basement, shed, or other accessory use structure attached to or part of the one family. The porch is an attached to accessory use structure in my reading of it. Um, so if you do it that way, I, I, and I, in terms of the basement, I don't know what the evidence is about whether 172 square feet of it is finished or unfinished. But uh, you look at the gross, and, and I don't think that when you look at the gross, you have to take out the gross amount of the unfinished basement that's listed there if you want to use the assessor's card to do it. I'm not saying that's the way you're supposed to do it. I think actually there should be an engineering drawing that should be submitted and a calculation done by an engineer based on an engineering drawing about these numbers. But if you're going to use 
the assessor's map or the assessor's card, you go to the line that says total gross area because that's what the bylaw says you're supposed to do. Look at the gross area. So I'll make one other additional point. When you're calculating gross in a house and you do the calculation with basements, the only part you include in the gross calculation of a house is the finished portion of a basement. It's standard procedure, regardless, right? The other thing with regards to the porch, if you look at the diagram in the, in the accessor's record, the porch is actually the, the mudroom, the breezeway. It's what connects the, the drive, the garage, to the house. It's part of the house. I think the distinction there is a finished porch versus an unfinished porch. And in this case, it is a finished porch. Therefore, finished it counts. Porch, yes. If it were an unfinished it's porch, it would be different. But it's it is fully, fully enclosed. enclosed and wet, you know, four, four season. Yeah. And I have no idea what a finished garage is, but it's finished. Let's throw it in. <laughs> have you ever seen a finished garage? That they, I've never seen that notation before. I don't even know, know what that is. It doesn't say finished or unfinished. It just says you exclude the garage in the bylaw. I, when I did my calculations, I, I'll tell you, I came up with 1,888 gross, gross square footage. And that is the sum total of the 858 twice for the first and second floors, gross, wall to wall, even though it's not habitable. Um, plus the, um, and I threw in 172 for a finished portion of the basement which I had questioned too, but even if I do that, it only comes out to be 888, 1,888 square feet. The, the garage is not intended to be part of this calculation. We, we took it, it out. Not, we agree. The garage is not. not we zeroed it out. The and, the same, and the, if you look at the assessor's card, the, um, the porch was done over a period of 20 years where it was first just a pouring, of, a platform pouring, then it had a roof, then it had screens, then it was enclosed to a, to a full. I don't know if it was done with permits because I didn't see the, the, mm -hmm. re the, the references to the permits aspect of it. So I don't know if it's a living area. The assessor is not the determining individual to determine what's livable and what's not livable. The, the person determining that is sitting right here tonight. But if he's never called out to do it, how would he know? And does the assessor go to the building inspector and say, is this, is this livable space? in this particular residence. No, they don't do that. So there's a question of what is what is the con, what is considered to be the livable space in part B of the bylaw again. So one point, two points of clarification on that. Um, one is you can't do 858 times two because the first 858 is the finished half story on the top. The second 858 is the basement. You're missing the, the middle floor of the base area. Right? So the, the basement, if you look at it very clearly, uh -huh. it's UVM is unfinished basement, that's yep. 858. You can't include that, I agree. It's unfinished, I mean, that's whatever. Okay. So you have the 858 of the, of the top floor or the finished half story. You have the one, 1,012, not 858, 1,012 of the base area, which is the base footprint of the house. The first floor. The first floor. Okay. Okay. So let me re redo my calculation. <laughs> You get the base the area. Card calls it FTP, yeah. Right. So what you're saying, you have the base area, Which the finish the, the, the porch for 130. Yep. Right? You're not counting the garage at all. Not at all. The finished second floor or half story. Yep. 858. Yep. Unfinished basement. You said uh, the there finished is a portion of the unfinished basement. The finished portion of the unfinished basement, which is 172. Yep. And then you have your total. And Correct. then through it now. Correct. Well, if I do that, it comes up to be 1,952 feet. So, so, so well, I'm going to pull out a calculator. <laughs> okay. I, frankly, <laughs> uh, and I'll show it. Can, I, Paul, can I approach, John? Sure. Yeah. Here's, here's what I drew up. It's all Excel, so it's calculated formulas to get to the numbers. Okay. You have the 1,012, you have the finished. And that's what FEP stands for, finished enclosed porch of 130. The finished half story of 858, the finished portion of the basement of 172, leads us to 2172. 
That's what it sounds like. There's just some addition. Yeah, and, yeah. It, and I I did not include I the, the enclosed porch. Okay. Because that was that was not there in in uh, in nineteen eighty. Yes, it was. It wasn't finished at that time. Yes, it was. Not that, in. Look, they I, call it FEP. They call it FEP on the document. That is the official assessor's record. They don't call it, there is unfinished enclosed porch too. If you look through all the, the record types, they specifically call it FEP. FEP, finished enclosed, finished enclosed porch. porch. And is that what you're calling the breezeway? The, that the, connects the breezeway the mudroom, okay. yep. Okay. You can see that in the picture as well. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, um, that assessor's record on the top right hand side is a, is a picture, a, a mock-up drawing of the house that shows the garage, the FEP, the base, the basement, and the finished half story. It's still not living area, with all due respect. It's part, it's an accessory use structure to the dwelling. And I, it's interesting if you look at the chart how selective Mr. Wise is about what he brings over to the adjusted gross. For example, he brings the full enclosed porch of 130 all the way to the end, even though the net is 91. According to the because it's a gross it's calculation. A right, we're not talking about that. It's a gross calculation. It's a gross calculation. That's what. It's Sorry. Field civil field. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's the bylaw. I think you had mentioned it's the bylaw gross calculation. Yeah. Gross calculation. Yeah. Of the dwelling. We we could sit here. We could discuss this. We can go back and forth, and we people take a look at the numbers and stuff. Personally, uh, you, you get in, you can get confused. On, I usually look to. Code enforcement officer, the building inspector, he will look at the numbers and it's his, he looks at it and says, okay, fine, they meet it, they don't. They add up or they don't add up. He would, you know, he goes out every day and calculates an enclosed porch. Yes, that's a living space. Who are we to argue with? That's what it is. If that's, so, if that's if, determined to be a mudroom. Yeah. I don't know how you can say that that's not it's probably yeah. the most used space yeah. in my house. <laughs> no. Jews and uh, nothing else. Do you, is this working for you now, John? Do uh, you still have uh, a question I, about I the mudroom? I mean, the, the difference yeah. is minor, but the, the, the minor it difference it. also reflects yeah. that it does not meet, it's, it's in excess of the one third. Yeah. So, so I mean, you'd have to have, um, I'd have, to, I'd have to do the calculations again, but I mean that the, the, the difference on um, some of this, even even if you take out the uh, what's what's in the finished basement again, uh, I, I, I don't know. That's all disputable. Part of it is well, uh, it's it's maybe disputable. I don't in think your it, personal mind, but I, I usually look in this particular case to the building inspector. Yeah, I don't, you is know, it disputable to him? No, I don't. I don't believe that. Um, this is the only so issue. Yeah. I don't want to be for you. This, this, yeah. this is not the only, well, for me, this yeah, is not so. the only issue yeah. in this particular case. No, no. Uh, so, I, you know, I, right. I, I don't want to I think concentrate on this when I think there are, I shouldn't say bigger questions, <laughs> why, but, I mean, oh. but there are other aspects of, of the request that we have to address. I think where we, where we started, if I recall, that one of the first things we discussed was you know, based on the criteria, Glenn, are you fine with it? And I, I thought it was yes, but you had an issue with the other things that we're talking about. The setbacks and everything else was, I, I didn't, I mean, maybe we just, you know. At the risk of letting Glenn speak for himself. Right? <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> let's let's well, as it's, it's, it's people bring up let's things, obviously, you can go back and, you know, have a change of mind if you needed to. Uh, so, let, go ahead, Glenn, please. Yeah. So, I, I wasn't questioning the square footages of those particular areas, but I did not see them. <clears throat> I, I, would, um, I would say a finished porch is not an accessory structure. It's part of the principal structure. So if it is, a, in fact, a finished porch, that would be included in the calculations. Uh, the, I would have to look at the basement area to see if that's truly a finished right. portion of the building or not, but that's 172. I thought there were enough other things wrong with the application that that, that minor difference in the calculations wouldn't make that much of a difference. Mm. I wasn't, um, in all the years that we've been here, um, I never looked, we never looked at paragraph E well, as it I, was presented I, to us tonight. Right. And I think there's some good merit into the requirements of that 
that section. Mm -hmm. So that that's a problem area right. with me. That, well, I that think for the, twenty years, paragraph. for twenty years, we we never looked at it as being different than the parking that was required in nineteen eight. That was there in nineteen eighty two. So that's that would affect a lot of uh, a lot of these projects. And it's it there. May. It's there in black and white. So, yeah. so I think it, I think it's uh, unfortunately it's it's a valid point. Well, in, in four months, it may not be there. And, and I still and I still say that the accessory structure should be part of the existing dwelling, not into, not into the proposed construction, unless we get a variance yes. from that. Right. The board, the applicant. I've always um, explained to the applicants that they need a special permit number one to be uh, to to get the accessory apartment. But also, in many cases, or in some cases, they'd have to apply for a variance from the requirements of that. Of the 1982. And it's primarily yeah. not being either the right square footage, which the board has allowed um, accessory apartments to exceed the one third or the 750 square feet a number of times, not, not by a lot, but in most cases, yeah. most of it was in the existing dwelling. Maybe a portion of it was outside of that. So. So that being said, yeah, there may be a little right. discrepancy in the square footages, but I think that's minor according to the other issues that are that are before the board. Right. right. Can Thank I just you. touch on E again? And I think it's never, I don't know why it's never, well, it's never come up because there's only been four of these in the last eight years, but it, it talks about not changing the parking as it was in 1982, but also allows for additional off-site parking. There are two parts to that as I read it. We are not touching 82. We are getting additional parking that's already been approved by at, at least by way of the curb cut to Can get I go the through that with you? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Because that as Glenn said, that's something that we've never touched upon. Yeah. And, and if Glenn thinks it's an issue, I want to make sure that we understand the reading of that section and how it might or might not apply so that we can take it into consideration or choose mm -hmm. not to. All right. So I'll paraphrase a little bit, bit of it, but I'll put some emphasis where I think emphasis is necessary. So the vehicles owned by occupants of the building in which the accessory apartment is located shall be parked off street, one, and the location and appearance of additional, all additional off street parking, additional off street parking shall not adversely affect the adjoining properties. So I think what that section goes directly to is the proposed mm. off street parking, not the existing off street parking. Agreed. The proposed off-street parking. No, I agree. I'm just and saying I, that it allows off-street additional parking. It it does, but there's uh, you know substantially more detrimental type uh, right. analysis there. Adversely affect the adjoining properties in the neighborhood, and so we have presented to us for consideration to give as much weight as the board feels is necessary. An objection under that section for that purpose, if I'm understanding council's presentation to us earlier. The only thing I was addressing is Glenn said changing the 82 parking. I just want yes. to make it clear, we're not, per the, per the bylaw, we're not changing 82. We are proposing additional parking. All right, so let me, so let me go on. So, so we have that issue, okay? And then we have, uh, and shall not, mean, may never adversely affect the adjoining properties in the neighborhood or the single family appearance of the neighborhood, and I understand you've already talked about other uh, single families in the neighborhood that have various shapes and numbers of, of driveways. And I, I, I haven't driven by the property, but maybe the board can, if any board members have. Um, and will cause no change to the front yard parking area, if any, as it existed on August 1, 1982. So that's your point, is that end of, the, of Section E uh, is unchanged Correct. from the existing parking under your, under your analysis. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Now I think I understand what we, why we're considering it. Thanks. And one other comment on the parking that I think is worth noting is that we do have the driveway going up the side yard of um, to the side of the accessory so that they can park that car back tucked behind the building. So it is not in the front yard. Um, it's the car when it's parked will be you know 30 feet back off of the street so I think that goes a long ways toward meeting the criteria of not being adversely not adversely affecting and then I think the other point that's worth noting is that we have already agreed to provide additional landscape screenage so if they don't want to look at a car we can put 
a row of evergreens there, so the car is 30 feet back from the street, tucked behind the structure itself, and we are willing to put landscape screening on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. Duly noted. Thank you for amplifying that. And and I, I, I will I will note too that it is not this board's uh, duty to review driveways and to review the shade trees and the cutting down of that. That is another entity in town that does do that, and it sounds several. like they have. Several other entities. Yeah. Several. Any yeah. response? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, with respect to the last comment you made, that is true. The other boards do have authorities to do what they do. I'm not sure that the board, that the board of selectmen who initially approved the second driveway here, uh, I, I think that's got to go back to them, and I'll tell you why. Uh, there was no public notice of that meeting, and we have already been to the uh, selectmen about that, and we're told that they're going to—they know they're going to have to have a second meeting because there were changes made. There were changes made to the drawings, and that the initial approval of that driveway was based on the drawings that they looked at back then. And in fact, as I understand it, they sent an email to Mr. Wise to that effect. So. I think that that second driveway is still in play, let's say. Regardless of whether or not the town, uh, the, so the Board of Selectmen have the right to approve or disapprove that driveway, this board has been empowered to grant special permits for accessory use apartments, and, and you have authority, based on that bylaw, to determine whether or not a right. proposed design, in this case, violates or meets the criteria of here, and I don't know how. And I agree with the building inspector here. How, how can anybody interpret the last part of section, subsection E, that you can't change the front parking area from what it looked like in 1982 to anything to mean other than you can't change the front parking area. You can add additional parking, put it around the back. Uh, you can take the existing driveway, which is in the front yard, make it longer. But you can't otherwise change or add more driveways. And that's consistent with the intent here, which is keep this looking like a single family. We don't want a lot of driveways, different parking lots in front of your house. It's more difficult. I, 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 I think a, a property, community, yeah. in a community like Reading um, or bordering communities, Winchester, Lexington, whatever, when you have something that's in black and white that you think you got all nailed down until you get into a court of law and then you have opposing attorneys mm -hmm. fighting back and forth between the, the wording in the bylaw. The intention, which is what I started out with, the intention and purpose when town meeting granted this was for a specific reason. Unfortunately, it got tagged with black and white stuff in the bylaw that everybody argues back and forth with. And you know, I, I think that the what your proposal is is great. If there was no kitchen in there and it was a shared kitchen like we talked about way back when, it's this th this whole thing in essence goes away. But it doesn't because you want to make an accessory apartment, which is a second dwelling unit, and that's the part of it that I am so direly um, against. Until we get a change in the bylaws. If we get a change in the bylaws that says we're going to allow two family structures to be converted, to convert capes and ranches to two family structures, fine. Because the, the town meeting and the selectmen and all the other boards say that this is what we want to do in the town of Reading. Great. But when it comes before this board, that's what this board will do. It'll look at what the black and white says, make the interpretations they see it, and move forward. But it is, it is difficult to sit here and, and, and make those judgment calls um, because with less land and with more available funds, people want to do more with their houses. And who are we to sit here and say no to somebody except what we are empowered to do, and that is we are the Zoning Board of Appeals. So we're supposed to look at this stuff and say, if there's an easy way of, if there's a way of getting, giving you an alternative to what's in the bylaw, we will do our very best to do that without breaking certain rules. 
And that's what I think the board is, is trying to do. And I know just, just two things quickly. I think what, what we're asking for uh, is for you to make a, a black and white determination as you have in the past. I mean, if we came in here and said, geez, we're gonna knock it down, we're gonna build a new house, we're gonna bigger than what was there, um, and we're gonna put an accessory apartment in, presumably we would be allowed to do that if we were following what this board has done. And, and the second thing I, I, I'd like to note is that Tom could have said, you know what, I'm not gonna put a stove in. We'd never be here. To, to put himself through this, I, you know, I think the board mm -hmm. really should commend him and talk about letter of the law. This could have been done a year ago, but to be honest, he looked at it and we looked at it and thought based on what had been done in the past and what we were proposing, this is what the bylaw was intended for. And I still believe that wholeheartedly. Counselor, if you go back to, because you keep bringing up the precedent aspect of it, if you go back and look at the last condition in the Whittier property, would you read that? I did. I said we would offer conditions. And what is the condition? While well, he's looking that up, I'll make... No well, I, I know what the condition is. Well, go ahead. I, I the condition is, is when this accessory apartment changes hands, ownership, um, usage, that the board must be notified. Fine. And you know, and it, it, you said it, anything can be challenged, and maybe this decision should have been challenged. It wasn't challenged, so but, but it again, goes through. We, we can't collectively make decisions on what something that mm -hmm. should have been challenged, or might be challenged, or will be challenged. No. Either way, this this might be challenged. Who knows? I know the board doesn't doesn't like it. Trust me. Yeah. Um, but you know that that's. We can't, and, we can't and deal I think, with that. And, and yes. the other thing I think is, Mr. Dreamer is right. We don't make decisions based on precedents. I th certainly think we take them into consideration what was maybe done in past cases. But each case is individualistic. Right. But how and are we to be we, guided? We, we make a decision by based the on the merits of that case. Okay. So if we can't look, it should be a case-by-case -case basis. Right. But this board always and consistently looks at past cases every time something comes up when there's a discussion. Always. You look to those cases for guidance where there is no other. There is an issue with interpretation of this bylaw. Where do we look? We look to the collective history of the board. We look to what the board has done in the past. Let's call it something else. Let's call it guidance. Instruction. I, I don't like the term precedent. It's scary as an attorney, trust me. But we have to be guided by something. There's nothing else out there. Should it have been challenged? If it was challenged and it went one way or the other, we would have even more guidance, but we don't. We are not looking for anything different than what was given in that case. Okay. In fact, we are looking for less. Okay. That's fine, yeah. And you have five okay. members here tonight yeah. that have uh, got the material and they, they will vote on that if, if that is what your decision is yeah. to have a vote tonight. Uh, uh, are there any more comments from the public on that? One other point of clarification. Yeah. Um, on the Board of Selectmen, um, yes, we did go before. Yes, it was approved before. Yes, due to the fact that we're shrinking the house by one foot two inches, and only for that reason do we have to go again. The driveway's not moving. Um, as to the point of public notice, it is a permit, not a special permit. It is a discussion with the Board of Selectmen. It does not require public notice. No. I think that's rebuttal. Again, let the lawyers. Let right. the lawyers that, that's that. rebuttal. <laughs> uh, there's no further comment from the public. I will close the public portion of the meeting. And I will say uh, quickly if we want to go through again, if there's any further comments from a board member, we would uh, hear them. If not, I would uh, be ready to entertain a motion unless I hear different from the uh, uh, applicant. Can we take five? Mm. So we can speak to my client. Anybody, any mm -hmm. member? Which? No, I'm, I'm, yep, I'm, I'm all set. You, you set, John, side? Point. You just asked for five minutes. I did. Yeah, pending oh, pending yeah, them having their five minutes. Let, let's let's okay. come back. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Yep. Five minute recess. Yeah. Okay. You would like a? Is that what you're Recess, talking? please. A five recess minutes. for five minutes. Absolutely Thank granted. You.
So can you fit your? <laughs> can you fit your? Five minutes. Minute? Yeah. You don't know. I'm just.
proceed with a, a, mo a motion. A motion. Yes. Uh, and if I have no further comments uh, from board members. I would just like to drop okay. this thought that uh, I, I think we all have to be perfectly clear exactly where we're voting on. Okay, there's a lot of discussion about various aspects of that section of the bylaws. So I'd like to make sure we all clearly understand exactly what it is we're talking about. Okay. And there's a lot of talk about the calculations. Frankly, I have no problem with what you have done. I don't know how to do it better, short of going out and measuring everything. Uh, the parking issue is a judgmental one, I think, uh, for this board to deal with. Uh, the issue is whether or not a variance is or is not considered necessary. One member of the board says no, other members of the board say yes. Others say maybe. <laughs> okay. So I guess I'd like to have a clear understanding, and maybe that's part of the motion. Mm -hmm. Okay. But a clear understanding of exactly what it is we are trying to address. Okay. Well, n number one, I think in the uh, actual legal notice, the petitioner has asked for a variance and a special <coughs> permit. So we, we will be voting on both those aspects. Now, whether it's motion includes that but he's also uh, made the uh, commentary in his presentation that he does not feel <coughs> that variance is required I think so the question is you folks agree with me that's an easy vote yeah, well, <coughs> if we were to agree with that then, then you could withdraw the thing or we could vote on it whatever okay if uh, uh, then I would uh, no further comments side I look to you for a motion then uh, if you would. Well, that means uh, I have to write it up and then leave <laughs> it. And I'm leaving for Europe in a day or two. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> so it's going to be very difficult for me to do that. I see. I see. Uh, I would be glad to, but I, I just don't see i got the time to do it. You won't be have, have won't the time. Be here. Right, right. Uh, and I know David has a, Eric, would you uh, entertain yep. making a motion? Thank you. Yep. I'll take the one the next time. Okay. <laughs> Whatever it is. Yes, and uh, then we can. Uh. All right. Well, I move that the, uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, approve the petition of Thomas Wise, who seeks a variance and a special permit under sections 4.3.2.8.2.B and 4.3.2.8. Of the zoning bylaws in order to add an addition to the existing single family dwelling and to create uh, an accessory apartment as per the plans submitted by the petitioner. I made a mess here. Um, <clears throat> most recently dated May 13th, 2013, uh, stamped by. Uh, is it? Oh. Thank you very much, Zach, for that. Yeah. Um, this is the. Uh, okay. Um, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Per the plot plan submitted by uh, Bodich and Crandall, Inc., um, 8 Holt Street, Belmont, Mass., 02478 and certified by John W. McEachern, Registered Professional Land Surveyor, dated May 18th, 2014, in the architectural drawings sheets marked A through A11, mm -hmm. prepared by Miller Design, LLC, 52 Stateler Road, Belmont, Mass., certified by D.B. Miller, Registered Architect, uh, all dated beginning November 25th, 2013, to the last update dated May 6, 2014, uh, on condition that the rental of the uh, accessory apartment is not allowed. Um, and you guys are fine with that condition? That I, yeah, I think we went a step further to mimic the condition on Whittier. Okay. We would notify the board if it was a sale, I believe. A change of ownership. Change of ownership. Change, change of ownership. Yeah. There's no dimension. Um, do you so want to do you want to motion with a special permit and the variance are one and the same? 
I would like to motion that. I don't know how the board feels about that, but I will add that in my motion. Before we go any further, the building inspector has brought up, well, maybe that is mine. The building inspector has brought up a, a valid point in that the plot plan that we just referred to that I think was provided as part of our mm -hmm. submission tonight has no dimensions on it. So I'm, I'm gonna make sure we're referring to the right plot plan. So if this is the that's this is the plot plan that Eric just referenced uh, in his motion. <coughs> Uh, okay. Dated May 18, 2014, stamped by John McEachran. Uh, May 18, 2014 is the latest I have, and it's noted underneath dimensions added. 17.5. Dimension added. What were we added? Are they added to the structure? Or is there another plan? I don't, I, don't have, I don't have my original letter of denial. No. I don't have the Where's the dimensions? I believe the dimensions that were added were the side dimensions that I had questioned. There should be dimensions on the structure. Yeah, no, he, they, they did not dimension that on the plot plan. No, I can, I can tell you that. Plan dimensions are on the architectural. Yeah, but the, the certified plot plan should have dimensions on it, not the architectural. I mean, the architectural should match the certified plot plan. And you, what you're really talking about is that there's <clears throat> there's no dimensions on the ex the uh, addition to the existing garage. There's no dimensions on the uh, proposed addition to the house. All that's done on the certified plot plan is the setback controls. Right. Dimensional controls. Right. And you, and we I, had I'm in the- I'm asking if there's another plan on it, it has those I dimensions. Don't, I, because I don't this just, just the architectural the plans that, that they say mirror, you know, what the addition is going to be. And, and, yes. and I think we've always required yep. that the plot plan that's referred to as part of the decision be complete. Because this is what is kept. The architectural plans are not necessarily kept. You want to condition it on, yes. you know, the, the plot plan matching it? I mean, it, it's not... I don't know that it's always required a plot plan typically to show the location of the finished product for your foundation plan and your architecturals are what deal with the building. So that's the package that was submitted. That's, I mean, typically, uh, that's how things would work. But that's, that's Glenn's no. call, and I'm, I can't speak for Glenn. I'm not going to speak for Glenn. So no, that's typically <laughs> the dimensions are on the well, certified plot plan. Right, and that's what we've always... And they should we'll match. Yeah, we've correct. talked they about this. Match the architectural. Right. We we've, we've talked about this in other. Well, cases I think we've talked where about this case someplace. We talked about well, this I case. Know it's in my. I know what I've talked won't about. Be, I mean, won't the as built plan that's going to have to be submitted if this is approved? That's not show. part of the decision, though. We can. Sure it is. If, if it, it would, would make the board, the if it would satisfy would, the board, we can um, offer a condition that we will provide updates to this we can certainly go back to the engineer and ask him to add additional dimensions to the drawings if that's what you were looking for mm -hmm. so we're willing to include that as a condition that will put additional drawing additional dimensions on this drawing and that those conditions those dimensions will match the architectural plan submitted with the application there's a timing factor here too and i think that's why glenn has always required that because it's a two two week write-up and sometimes your engineers can't get out in two weeks and get it known, <coughs> brought back to them sufficiently in time uh, that that's recorded. Um, so that again, that's uh, the board has always done it in that particular way. Glenn has always required that. Side, you said I had just, a copy of the plot plan the before. That uh, there's none on there. The, the we, actual we building dimensions. Which haven't had those dimensions on there. I, that's okay. You can go back and research it. Okay. Uh, because they're picked up from the yard. Sure. I mean, we, if, if, it, if it's in any consolation, we did a, a slide showing that. We know they all match, so it's just yeah. a matter of, of getting the documentation right. that Glenn would like. I think the major concerns of this board are setbacks, right. frontages, well, if, all if that this, stuff. If this 14 foot five and a half dimension doesn't correspond to 17.75 feet, what do we do then? What 14 and a half foot depth? What page are you on? I'm on A5, drawing A5. It shows a foundation plan. 
right? This dimension here is very, the proposed is very new explicit at 14 foot five and a half inches. When, if I may, the engineer, I sent him my CAD drawings showing the footprint and he used that drawing as the base for his drawing. Okay. So they do match. I mean, he, he used oh. the same drawing. I, I think to me, the, the actual addition coming off the house, 14 yeah. feet, five and a half inches, right. if it does not agree with with this setback of 17.75. Well, then he's, he's got an issue with you. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, obviously. <laughs> so, so we're all done, right? <laughs> so so we, we don't have a valid. Nope. It, it, it's so we're coming back to start all over again if it's off a half an inch or an inch. Uh, I'm saying if, if, if the architectural drawing and that plot plan are not in concert with one another when you get into it, if they don't match, no, I, it, 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 match. If, if, if something changes, the square footage, if the dimension changes, the square footage changes, right? The square footage has already been under. Right. I think, I think we now. agree if we build what's in the architectural plans, it, it matches this. If something's amiss in the building, it doesn't matter what's on here. We have a problem. Right. It'd be the same thing if you submitted a plot plan with all dimensions right. and something was built incorrectly. And, and, and I believe, you know, with the 17.75 feet they have for the side setback there, We're gonna the side they've, setback. Left, they've left some wiggle room for themselves okay. in regards to the okay. setback. Well, that's up to you, to the board. Uh, I'm comfortable with the plan, and if, if the they start building this and they don't work, you must deal with the building inspector and obviously he's gonna say, well, you're not 17.75 feet, you're 17.3 feet and you still meet the side setback, but you just have to work that out with the building inspector. Right. You, you must make meet the side setback or you will be back yeah. here. Yeah. Well, but that was, there, that'd be our foundation plan, so that right. would be a mistake yeah. that was made when putting the foundation in. Right. So we'd be subject to that no matter what we submit. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so we're. So the Ooh, I'll just throw on floor. those conditions. The, motion, the motion's on the floor. Well, I have to throw in the, the conditions for the special permit. Okay. No, I'll just throw those in, our normal ones. Uh, the special permit is conditioned upon the following. Petitioner shall submit to the building inspector a certified plot plan of the proposed construction and proposed foundation plans prior to the issuance of the foundation permit for the work. Petitioner's final construction plans for the new structure shall be submitted to the building inspector along with the as-built foundation plans prior to the issuance of a building permit and the as-built plans showing the completed construction of the new structure being submitted to the building inspector immediately after the work is completed and prior to the issuance of an occupancy permit. Um, and I guess we'll just add that uh, any change of ownership will uh, require um, the new owner to come before the board. And the only thing I will add to that now, in the variance request, Eric, uh, the variance is in regards to section B, yes, as opposed to section A. That's oh, what he's yes. requested. Yes, yeah. and I know we've done in the past just a section A. Section B is asking for a variance in regards to. Uh, I guess we're talking the square footage, etc. Why don't we know occupying I mean. of the 1982 area? Right. I mean, I mean, I guess for me, it, yeah. it was not an issue. So it's, yeah. And that's what that's what right. he drafted the motion. Right. So that's what that's, we're voting. That's what we're voting on. Right. right. Can I just be made clear on the the <laughs> occupancy, the end occupancy condition? Can you? Sure. I mean, I was just going by. Yeah, I think we maybe were a little vague if last time. If there's a change in the occupancy of the accessory apartment, the board must be notified. That's, that's verbatim from a, the other decision. Yeah. Right. So uh, I'll be happy to add to that if, if the board will, will allow me. Um, <clears throat> in the event of uh, a change of ownership, um, anyone seeking to avail themselves of the special permit uh, shall come before the board. And uh, I guess uh, submit a, an application for a, a special permit for themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Any further questions? Uh, Lane, you have a question? Yeah. What are we doing about paragraph E now on the variance? 
that is not a uh, requested relief. It's not requested relief, and it's it's, it's going to be an issue with me. So, so what you're saying is that they come back to the board if we vote affirmatively on All right. All right. Eric's motion. Yeah, I mean they're not asking for it, so you know, I'm not, I don't even know if we could so uh, hear it. Am I right, John? Well, I mean you. See, I don't agree with the separation of the variance. Uh, I don't agree with the, the compilation of the variance and special permit all in one motion. Mm -hmm. I think we need two separate motions. Right. Uh, but if, if we're voting on that, which, which has been second, so we not even well. should be discussing it, <laughs> but um, the reality is you're, in, in, you're compiling everything into one big motion. So yeah. either mo the big motion fails or it passes. Right. Well, before we, before we get a second, let's get yeah. a, go ahead. It it would be my opinion now that I'm aware of paragraph E that that has to be addressed. Because the way it is here, the, the, the permit probably will not be issued, right. whether or not we get a special permit or a variance for other things. So as so I that means so this ball is going to be rolling along unless. Unless maybe somebody wants to continue it to address that section, so I mean I know All right. the applicants. You know he's spending a lot of time doing this, and that's a new item on the block. That's, in my opinion, is, is necessary to address. Mm -hmm. So All right. So as a practical matter, if the vote, if the if the board votes to grant affirmative relief tonight, then it's likely that. The building inspector is going to have an issue with issuing a permit and would likely require that the petitioner come back before this board on for relief, uh, for relief under subsection E. Is that, right. that an accurate statement? Yes. Petitioner, knowing that that's possibly the case, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Knowing that that's possibly the case, do you still want us to vote on your petition tonight? Or do you want to continue it, address that issue, and come back? I guess that I'm, I'm sorry. No, that no, that's fine, David. I, I don't want to speak for the chair. So. You're not. You know, you're, you're speaking for the board. That's fine. Is that is that I'm an accurate? Is that an accurate yes, statement? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Number one, so I think it was right. It was not advertised that in regards for a relief from subsection E uh, on that. So uh, I think it may have to come back that way. I'm to personally, I don't have an issue with with E myself. No, that's me. But you've heard from the code enforcement officer that that's right. he does. He did. And so he may have an issue, so right. that would be I, then. I, I think this is similar to, uh, I forget which case it was, where the board says, we have we've are, are, are going to, in the, right. uh, assuming it's in the affirmative, we are going to grant the variance requested. We have reviewed all of the other right. uh, provisions that are required, and, and we have no issue with it. Right. We, have a mo we have a motion here. But keep in mind, the building inspector has noted that he has an issue with E, and it may get to the point where he would uh, not issue a permit that you would require, and you may have to come back to the board appealing his decision. Understood. Okay. So Correct? Can I, I mean, just as a point of order, I mean, I, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm being dense. Right, so if you specifically say, as you have in other rulings, that you re reviewed the specific variance and all other criteria, and that you are granting the variance and the special permit, how, how can he then object when he didn't object in the first place to that item if you specifically review all those items and say you reviewed them? I mean, that wasn't rejected initially. There was no reason for it. It was in the bylaw. You know where it's going. We're going to go to court. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, it's, it's regardless of which way we vote, we're going to court. Period. That's obvious here. So it doesn't make any difference what we do tonight because it's going to land up in court because that's it, exactly it, what happens when there's a content, contentious, contentious situation. That's where we where we go. I mean. I just, the reason, I the reason for having these, the reason for having these hearings is to try to work all this stuff out before you get to that point. But 
apparently we sure. can't do that. So yeah. even the even the board itself may have trouble yeah. doing that. Yeah. So I mean, well, Tom, yeah. with due respect, there's nothing else we could have tried. Okay. Let's let's play it back again. I, not, what was not in this package that we got to review was your rejection letter. I never saw. I don't recall seeing. It. That was in the initial one. It was in the original way back. That was, no, that that was the original. There was, in that there case, was one for this board. particular case. There's one for this particular is there? case. We don't have yeah. it. Now, did that take issue? This is a new case. This is a new That's case number. We don't have it. There's, there's a letter of denial for this case. We don't have it. Does that, no. No. Does that letter of denial include no. section? No. 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 no, the parking was not in the file. I was made aware of that tonight. But did you knowing that tonight, I would have to, I'd have to address that. And did that's your denial. And that's what I'm, so, right. And I'm saying. So what I'm saying is, if, if there's a favorable decision here tonight, it's going to be, it's probably going to be held up when they come to me and I'm going to tell them they need a variance for the parking. Right. So the way so I read it, right. the way I'm interpreting it, right. did, that can be appealed and overturned or yeah, granted. Exactly. Did we were you act on it tonight? So I wasn't aware of it. I made that statement. I haven't been aware right. of it for 20 years. Right. Okay. Did your denial I'm, I'm address? One second, I'll let you. Yep. Did your denial? Do you remember? Did your denial? Uh, I have it right here. Address? Did it? I have a copy of it. it. Can I take a peek, yes. please? Thank I have you. So, the building inspector's denial says a special permit from section 4328 is required. That's the entire section, right. I would argue, including right. section e. 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 So, and in your case, a variance is also required from the restrictions of 43282. Any ambiguity about that, that that anybody on the board would like to offer? Or does that present an ambiguity that the board would like to ask Glenn about? That's very specific. Okay. And continue reading it. The certified, we talked about 43282B. Yeah. Right? The certified plot plan dated must indicate existing and proposed structures with dimensions and setbacks. They don't. Dimensions. Of the plot plan should match the dimensions of the proposed construction drawings. I suggest sure that you submit an updated plot plan with additional information two weeks prior to the schedule of the ZBA hearing. All right, so does anybody else want to take a look? I know he's been reading it, but does anybody else want to take a look at that? So the variance denial is section B. Is that that's that's yeah. what the variance is for. So there was no B. denial on section E? No, it says it lists the, the sections permit. of it in four feet. Right. I'm just kind of confused how we apply it. The bylaw hasn't changed. There was no reject. There's a specific rejection on B. There's not a specific rejection on E, but now there's going to be? No, not, not before the board here tonight. No, 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 I understand. But yeah. well, Glenn's all but said it to us. Um, that to me, I'm, I'm, I guess we have to leave that issue aside. I'm, I'm perplexed that's by right. it. Right, that's what we're saying. Beyond this that point. may be that's an issue. Ball down the road. That may be down the road. We don't know. But it may come back here I'm just trying to, wrap to this head board. Head. Well, right. I'm just right. I'm just trying to mention this exactly. to give somebody an opportunity that they may want to continue it and cover that base. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so unfortunately, I, I made a mistake and didn't address paragraph E. Now I know about paragraph E, right. and I will address it. The continuance is not going to help us because it wasn't applied for because it wasn't rejected. <clears throat> so it's a new case either way. Right. Uh, it's, been it's been advertised for a variance under 4328 right. along with which is uh, which the, the accessory apartment. So all the all the mm -hmm. items in there mm -hmm. could be argued. So you right. don't have to advertise them. Yeah. You can continue it, okay. at least right. in my mind, <laughs> continue it until you get res results here. Rather than going out Correct. and spending another two, three months getting this whole thing done all over again. But the, to, the, to the same point, the board can say they've reviewed 4328, Six. inclusive of E, and if that is what you you agree to, That's the you could also no, say no, you no, reviewed no, it. No, 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 you're missing the point. You are the per individuals that are controlling this, not the board. The board's already made a motion. The consequences of that motion, if it's in the affirmative, you've heard what they may be, which means you'd have to go back into the process again. The other option is you could ask for an extension and say, I'm going to come back after hearing what the, the building inspector has noted, and I'm going to address it. 
But the motion is right now being written. That's what we're discussing. It hasn't, so correct, it hasn't been seconded yet. It right, so we're suggesting seconded. as Eric is crafting the motion, we're suggesting that he, <laughs> that he list the 4.3.2.8 inclusive of E, that perhaps he can write that into his, but he's saying it is the whole thing as it's listed in the denial. If that's what, if that's what you want, the board is gonna vote on that specific motion that was made by Eric and eventually will be seconded because everything is is uh, motioned in the affirmative. The board right. has always right. done We that. would like the board to vote on the entire section. But I, I, I don't see how you can if that's what, I, I, I just assume that was the vote. I mean, either way, it's it's coming back to Glenn, right? Well, but I, no, wait no, no, I, 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 think the board, I think the way that's written, we're talking about a variance from 43282, right? Yeah. E is four, included three, two, in that. Right. So I think the board could address that. I think we could, and yeah. I also think yeah. it wasn't specifically was mentioned that paragraph. But I, I feel the board could address that. Was this is this a this attached appended to your denial, or is it just your one page denial? Is this there addition to your denial? It's the highlighting. That's our no, no. The, sec, the second the, two pages. Yeah, the attachment was from him. That it's from him. Right. So, so I'm, I think it's a little bit. Un, I don't think it's completely accurate that the, the denial did not include every section of 4382 where he attached a copy of the entire section to your denial. My opinion, the board may not share it. My opinion. So, it does that I think, um, I think Glenn's right and I think we can, I think we can include paragraph E even though it's not specifically uh, well, I think it, I think it's a, the board's job to make sure that if we're going to issue the special permit, you address all of the conditions that are under that, and if they comply, good. If they don't, we have well, an issue. But if, if we're here's, here's the situation. The motion is made by Eric. Eric is including everything in that motion. Right. Including E. E. You've already stated e. that you have a problem with E. Yep. And it's already in your denial letter. If the board votes at least four out of the five, and it passes. When it comes to you, you're gonna reject it, in essence. Well, which is beside, which is past this point on this particular motion before us tonight. The petitioner has the option of saying, if I wanted to include the rest of the things that you have, I don't have to go out and create a brand new petition before the Board of Appeals. I can go back and justify section E because that's an issue and try to get it resolved before the motion is, is, is uh, voted on because we haven't seconded it yet. If we seconded it, we gotta vote on it. Okay, so so, so if, I, if I rephrase my train of thought here, okay, the, the 43282 includes paragraphs A through F. Right. I'm asking the board to look at paragraph E when they make the decision. Because I think I think I have an issue with that. Yes. So if you vote in favor of this, I'm gonna assume that you're overlooking paragraph E. Overlooking or, or including. including. Right? It should be included. It's in it's in it's in four three two eight two. Well taking it into consideration. So, so E is included. And finally I'm bringing that a, at this meeting I'm bringing up the point that I I think I think that we have a valid uh, question on whether or not this this project complies with it. John, what's the vote makeup? Can I make a suggestion? Pardon me? What's the vote makeup? <laughs> Number of votes tonight. We need four out of five. Yeah, you need four out of five. Can I make a suggestion? Yes. I, I think that, with all the, the respect to the motion, perhaps you vote on the six factors or seven factors to determine whether they've met each one of them. To the extent that there are any that the board votes that they did not meet with respect to those, then the issue is, would the board be willing to grant them a variance from meeting that specific factor? And then so let's say they meet five out of the six or five out of the seven. Then there are only two remaining where maybe they, the board uh, the majority of the board doesn't think they, they they get a special permit, then the board has to vote whether or not with respect to those two, 
they met the requirements necessary to get a variance with respect to those jobs. But we all know that if you don't meet all eight of them, whether you have a variance or not, if you have the variance, fine. If you don't have the variance, if you don't meet all eight, you don't get the, uh, you don't, you don't get a yes. You can't say, I'll take, I'll, I'll, the board will allow six out of the eight. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think the law does that. That's precisely what a variance is for. A variance is, is designed to give you relief from the zoning provisions. Okay. So, so you okay, say section yeah. section E. Are we ready to to take care of section E tonight? So what you're saying is we're going to go through each section and, and well, say whether we agree or not agree. That's what he's suggesting. No, no I don't think so. That would be the best way to preserve the I record think, so that we know I, whether you're getting never done that. You're voting it on. I think we vote whether they've met the criteria for an accessory apartment or they don't meet the criteria. They have asked for a variance Those from B. Those are the conditions, and that's it. There's that must be met. There's yeah. Right. Other than B, which they've asked for a variance for, you're voting that they've met all the other conditions. Those are con those are the conditions. At a minimum, yep. those conditions must be met. Right. In order to get a special permit. Right. And, the, and the motion that we've put on the floor is that all the conditions have been met, including granting the variance for B and giving or or affirmatively. Uh, moving forward on a special permit for the accessory department, which is 4328. Which includes E. Which includes E. Yeah, yeah. which includes E. Yeah. Right. So, so, so if it's that That's second, it. the, board has to, the board has to move forward on that and take a vote, right. yes or no? Before, I, before it's second, can I ask one point of clarification? I think we got two competing answers between the two of you about how many people had to vote to approve. John, I think you said four. Dave, I think you said simple majority. Super. Super, super majority. majority. Four out of five. So it's four out of five. And what are the repercussions if they don't? If, the permit? if they do not get their uh, uh, request tonight, if, if requests are denied for the variance in the special permit, I believe it's two years, is it not? Then? Yeah. Two years to come Unless back. Unless there's a substantial change in circumstances. Yes. Unless it's a, 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 it's a complete, unless it's a complete that. new. Because of the variance portion package. of it. Not because right. of the special permit section, not because of the variance section. There wouldn't be a new variance with the new bylaws. We're not there. <laughs> <laughs> There's that crystal ball. <coughs> um, okay. So. I mean, it, can I have five? I mean, this is kind of a significant. <laughs> well, it, it, you know, I didn't, I didn't create it, but I'd like to counsel my client on it. It's up to the chair. You, you request uh, a, a literal five-minute recess. You, you requested five before and we're out ten. I want to see five, period. That's it. Be <laughs> back here. See that clock? Quarter or nine? It's nine. Understood. Quarter at ten. Be back.
So you said it's with uh, the legal of accepted rights of the other. So what you're starting with is just that. The legal of ownership. The le what you said, the legal of accepted rights. Yeah. And I mean, just the stuff that's filed with the county. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I don't, I don't plan on doing legal work on any part of it. I just, I'm not familiar with it. I just was, I had made a request to have it, the updated version that we worked on last night was not filed. back in order, recess is over. Uh, I think if the court can go into some time with us as well. Yeah, with, without prejudice. Um, it, it, it's just, it, this has now become a lot more than um, what we expected from the process. There's a lot of loose ends. Uh, I think a continuance is not gonna move the ball ahead. I think we need to regroup significantly um, based on a lot of different things. So. Uh, just to make sure procedurally wise, we do have a motion on the table and I believe we can ask the person who made that motion if he would like to withdraw his motion. Mr. Chairman, I will move to withdraw the motion on the floor. Okay. Uh, and then I'll make a motion to okay. approve. Or, or we have, oh, I have to uh, second, second, second his, his motion request to, to withdraw, withdraw his, motion, his motion, I think. Okay. And then we vote on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have a uh, motion <laughs> on the board second to withdraw his request of his, or his Any motion. motion. Uh, all those in favor, raise your hand. Okay, five zero zero on the request to withdraw the motion. Okay. okay. And then I'll make a motion to that the board approve the petitioner's request to withdraw the entirety of their petition? Without prejudice. Without prejudice. Without prejudice. Okay. Without prejudice. I'm sorry, who seconded that? We haven't seconded Nobody. it yet. Yeah. Nobody have. I, I said we have a motion on the board. Would somebody like to second that? Second. Mr. Jarima is seconding that. Uh, uh, all those in favor of the petitioner's request to withdraw without prejudice? Raise your hand. Thank you. And uh, so is there any paperwork we, yes. that Maureen I has think there is something. Isn't yeah. there, Maureen, that the petitioner signs uh, something so for a request without? No, nothing. Just for just, a continuance? Yeah, just to a continuance we do with separate paper. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, no, I think it's reflected in the minutes. Uh, we do have to write a decision on that. Yeah, 
Yes, you put something together. Just a small. It's just for record keeping. Right, keep record keeping mm -hmm. yep, on withdrawal without prejudice. Eric, if you would do that. I would be happy to do that. Thank you. Okay. Oh, appreciate uh, the board's work. So I, I think we're through here right now. You are voted on to withdraw without prejudice. And uh, we will write something up, n up on that and get it into the file. All right, who's writing that? Mm -hmm. Eric is going to write that up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry. Um, Do we have some on minutes? The, on the minutes, the three sets of minutes. Mm -hmm. go, go right ahead. I'm, I'm just writing this yeah. here. Yeah, why don't we can I can do that? Uh, Thanks. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks, <laughs> Poor guy. I'll see you. <laughs> next meeting. Maybe I won't come to the next meeting. <laughs> Okay, oh, the well, next one is canceled. You don't have to come to that, Glenn. That, that's the one for next week. Yeah, yeah. Canceled. yeah so the next um, one is August 17th. 17th. Yeah. Um, on the minutes, I only received comments on August seven. Uh, June 19th, and they were very minor, and you'll actually see them in your copy. Okay. Yeah, I. A couple of little. Uh, I had a couple of grammatical things I sent you. A couple of little yeah. grammatical things there on the third page. I, and just, that was I just noticed one thing on the CBA of 515. Um, okay. It's not 05. <coughs> oh, wow. Well, what do you mean 05? Oh, 05. Must have got them mixed up in the, yeah, in yeah. the uh, <coughs> all three of the minutes. Petitions, yeah, they got it. They're probably on the bottom. Okay. Nope. No, I messed them all up. Oh, you messed them all up? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was all, all over this package of documents. So we have the. Uh, we get the minutes before us uh, right now. Uh, Right. I will. Okay. Uh, why don't we go in order? Uh, somebody has any? Okay. The minutes of uh, let's see, five. Uh, five fifteen oh five. No, fourteen. I was having a flashback. Oh, <laughs> it should be five fourteen. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Uh, any other comments on that? No, I didn't receive any other comments. Okay. That, uh, do I hear a motion on uh, the minutes of uh, 5.14.05 to accept as, as amended? Yes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Uh, minutes of, uh, is that the same thing then, 5.21.14 or 5.22? 5.22, that's what it says. But if the other one was 14. No, it's 515, 14. That was the oh, year. Oh, I'm year, sorry. Year, year, I'm sorry. It was the year. Okay. 522, four, my mistake. Uh, any uh, comments on that? Uh, on the uh, minutes of uh, 522, 14? If not, I would uh, entertain a motion to accept those minutes. Motion to approve the minutes of 522, 14 as written. 
Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? And the final minutes we have is uh, 619.14. Minutes of 619.14. Any comments? I have a couple, and it looks like, uh, well, somebody's written them here in pencil that they're going to take uh, care yes. of them. Yeah, yeah I had a. Uh, Those are yours, they're on the third page. Right, third page. Uh, special permit is conditioned upon me. And. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there were some misspellings and some grammatical in there. I had corrected. I didn't have time to. Make okay, so emails. she'll take care of those. Uh, any further comments on 619.14? If not, I'd entertain a motion to accept those minutes as written. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Thank you. And that takes care of the minutes. Uh, I know we had something else on the agenda tonight in regards to, I had it here, David was going to give a briefing, though we're here quite late, in regards to the advisory committee, ZBA, uh, excuse me, the bylaw advisory committee, the ZBA committee, if he would like to, that's fine. I know we, Maureen had uh, sent us uh, a copy of supposedly one of the bylaws changes to uh, uh, a section and uh, from what we understand uh, that has been changed since so we, we're not even going to discuss that right the yeah the, the intent ahead, was to present a draft of the updated or proposed updated section for non-conforming lots uses and structures right to our board for uh, consideration uh, and comment uh, because the zoning advisor the advisory committee uh, we all agree that ZBA comment would be helpful useful and in some cases I think <coughs> necessary to a good solid non-conforming rewrite uh, however uh, as recently as last night, the section draft section that the board was our board was provided with has changed significantly, and we don't have an updated version of that. So I would just assume not waste our valuable time at this hour going over some a draft that's already been changed. Right. Uh, I will uh, I'll talk to the zoning advisory committee when I s well I suppose it's probably too late. I'll double check to see if there is a version. Uh, matching our updated version from last night, and if it's on a if it's on a publicly available website, I may notify Maureen, Maureen yeah. uh, who can maybe point it out to the members of the board uh, if they'd like to go on and take a look at it and offer any comment. It's still a draft. The draft is being presented to the board of selectmen, unless I'm wrong, and that changes next Tuesday uh, for their consideration as the next step in the process. Okay. Thank you, David. Would, would that mean nope. that um, you could, um, would it be appropriate for Zach to um, send out a copy of the proposed changes under 6.3 and example assessment project to the board? Or do we need to have the selectmen see that first? Well, everything Our is. Our comments are not going to get in there because it's, Timing is yeah, I, I, the, this board's comments might not make it to the draft yeah. document that's going to be presented to the Board of Selectmen, but the draft that's being presented to the Board of Selectmen is just that, a draft. Right. Uh, so there is still plenty of time between now and when they write the warrant, um, draft the warrant to provide additional comments, and I will talk to the, the town planner um, to see if we still think it's a, I still think it's a valid exercise to see if she still thinks it's a valid exercise uh, for us to make note to this board for a comment. I think they would be valuable comments from this board. Sure. That's a section that we deal with um, consistently. There have been significant streamlines made uh, in my view and I was of the opinion that I think we all want to take a look at that um, to make sure that the proposed streamlines are in keeping with what we like to see because ultimately we're going to be the permit granting authority and, and uh, this board will be the permit granting authority with regard to that section. Right. So I'll, I'll 
wait to hear from Maureen. I'll, I'll communicate with Maureen and sure. daytime government, and we'll sort it out and provide access if, if and when necessary. But that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. There's no rush. At this point, yeah. no rush. No problem. Mm -hmm. yep. Even though I know how to get a hold of you when you're closed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think that takes care of business. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you uh, for your attention tonight, uh, board members. It was a heady case, and uh, we get them every so often.